everyone to, to the, the sec second episode of Bridges. I'm Kyla. This is Steven. And we have a guest, Ryan Macbeth. We're going to get into it. Roll that intro. You have to have more places for people to live. Anybody is triggered in this room is not me. Okay. So it's fine. You can be rich. Just explain it. I'll explain it again. Tell us something very cute. I feel like I'm the big barriers. You got, got some merch, you got, got some gifts, and you got some stories to share. Absolutely. You know, you know I, uh, so, so I, 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 Bunker, Bunker Branding, Branding is actually one of my sponsors. sponsors. I, told I told him I was coming on the show. show. Uh, Clint, Clint over Bunker Branding. Branding. This, this guy is absolutely, absolutely amazing. amazing. So, so he uh, presents, presents you with this, uh, uh, yes. this uh, U.S. Navy, world's, world's largest distributor of Iranian drone parts, which leads back to the U.S.'s Carney, which I'd love to talk about. And, uh, and uh, I, got I got you a, 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 a live, live, laugh, launch, launch for Trident, Trident missile, missile shirt. <laughs> <laughs> so, you can so you funny and weighs it. It's like so way funny. too long to explain. But. You should definitely, definitely explain to him all, all of the lore, lore of why that's so funny. funny. I would love, I would love to hear that lore. That I, I got the, uh, there's this ship called the USS Kearney, and it's been in the Red Sea. And this ship has been sailing for months now, shooting down incoming Houthi missiles, protecting international shipping, protecting the lives of the mariners on those ships. And right now, I think they've, they've destroyed over 55 missiles, or they're 55 and 0. And uh, when, I, when I heard about that, I was like, man, I wanna send these guys some, some shirts. I have another shirt on Bunker Branding called Department of the Boat People. <laughs> and I, I say that because the Navy is it's like a, like this different planet to me, you know? Like they have these ships and I'm thinking like, wait, why don't you carry around a bunch of dirt? That way if you come under fire, you can dig a foxhole like we did in the army, right? And I, I uh, so I asked if I could send some of these shirts. I talked to Bunker Branding because I was gonna make a big order. Bunker Branding sent all the shirts themselves. They have been a fantastic organization. And I, I love working with these guys. And uh, they're trying to bring manufacturing back to America. They're based out of Texas. And I'm really proud to be represented by that company. Cool. Do you want to tell the lore of why that shirt is I so extra funny? It would actually be, I, I can't, I truly can't. <laughs> There's a frequent guest on my stream, uh, ex-guest called Lav, and she lies a lot. So we have a saying called live, lav, lie. Oh, and I thought it was like a missile, like you're into rockets, right? Like, <laughs> no. Who is I mean, it's rockets? a kind of missile. It's a kind of torpedoing. It's a yeah. kind of, uh, like it's torpedoes a, your life, your yeah, career. Yeah, basically, yeah. That's, that's, <laughs> I, I gotta tell you, I, this place here in Miami, all right? So I, I've been to Miami before. Okay. Normally we, I land, take an Uber to- Your hotel uh, usually hotel. works. Your hotel yeah. usually works. Yeah. That wasn't your fault. <laughs> so for, for those of you who uh, are at home right now, I got in, it's spring break, there's torrential rains, and then I get to the hotel that, that Kyla booked, and uh, the hotel has a power outage and there's trucks there, so there was, you know, we had to go get another hotel. Now the hotel that she booked, it, it's the most gorgeous hotel I think I've ever stayed in. It's amazing. And I, I went down, stairs for breakfast right I'm going downstairs for breakfast and uh there's this there's this guy and he's surrounded by like six gorgeous women and they're all wearing bikinis the guy must be 25 <laughs> and they're wearing bikinis with a little, like a see-through cover-up and i'm thinking like how how is this real like who are you right and they're talking about how they're going on a boat like a boat i have one chair <laughs> yeah, like i just moved and like my my house was Wait, your whole by apartment the, is just one chair right so now. So I act so funny story about that. You sleep on like milk crates. Uh, not quite that bad, <laughs> okay. but I so I I was I was living in an apartment in Silver Spring, and they were going to raise my rent uh, from twenty five hundred to thirty two hundred a month, Whew. which is a significant increase. Yep. And so uh, I was like, you know, I 
why am I paying for this? I'm paying for a two bedroom apartment. Like there's no advantages of living here anymore. Like now I'm almost 50. I'm that old guy going out to the bar. Like, oh, why is he here? Right? When does that happen? When does that happen? At what age do you become the old guy going to the bar? Uh, apparently 35. at almost 50. Okay. You're I've heard it's 35 is like the- 35, you're the, the old guy role. at the bar? Well, because Dan is 40 and that's kind of like almost 50, I think. So <laughs> it's a friend of the stream. Yeah. Would you say Dan is almost 50? I think Dan looks better than you do though. Why would you make it about appearance? Because hitting the wall is all about appearance. No, not yes, for men. Yes, it is. For women, it might be. For men, we have more to offer the world. Like right? standing on your wallet? We're like a fine liquor that ages I, you well. Know, and, or is that I, only wine? Or, if I, I have more to offer the world, I, I would like to know what that is. I've often said I'm like a really good preview to a really bad movie. Okay. <laughs> I, I got, I, in, in, you know, you look at Ryan McBeth and you go like, oh, wow, that guy, he's educated. He's got three degrees. You know, wait, you have three, uh, wait, what are all your degrees in? I have a bachelor's in computer science, a okay. master's in engineering management, and a, an MSc in cybersecurity. Gotcha. Wow. Bachelor's in computer science for you. Does that mean that you were working with like the computers that take up the whole room? or? Uh, Damn. Some of the I'm computers. Sorry, that's mean. Was, He's just, being mean to you. I was being that's, that's actually a good question. Damn, I worked on a lot of rude. ISR projects, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance. I mm -hmm. worked on it for Accenture. <laughs> and uh, <clears throat> some of those computers did take up the whole room, but there were multiple server blades. And the room was like a shipping container. Did you, um, were all of those, uh, all of those bachelors paid for by military? Or did uh, you do some school and go on? Yes and no. All okay. right. So here's okay. how I got my cybersecurity year. So the, the bachelor's in computer science is paid for by the military. Nice. The master's in engineering management, which is almost like an MBA for engineers, that was paid for by the military. And then I ended up at this, this one company, and there was this one guy. I'm going to call him Dave, because that was his name. Fucking Dave. And Dave, well, we were in a meeting. And the subject of cross-domain solutions was brought up. Now, cross-domain solution is a computer solution that allows you to transfer data from an area of low trust to an area of high trust. So, like, if you have a drone feed, that that drone's camera is technically unsecure, and it has to get back to the tactical operations center or the wherever, and then it has to go into a higher level of security. And so it passes through what's called a cross-domain solution, where we look at the data and we scrub it, we make sure the data is good, it's not gonna harm anything, there's no enemy route into our systems through this data feed. So I'm in this meeting and Dave says something about cross-domain solutions that was wrong. Oh no. And I, I held my tongue, because you know what? Wait, 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 wait. Uh -huh. Is Dave older or younger than you? And is Dave we're above about the you? Same or... age. We're about the same age. Does he outrank you or are you guys even? No, this is civilian. Okay, okay, okay. He oh, was okay, okay. like the director of cybersecurity at this one gotcha, gotcha. project we're on. Okay. And so he said something wrong. And I went like, ooh, all right. But one of the rules I've lived by is that people will always remember how you made them feel. <laughs> always. What you That's why I bully why everybody. I laugh? agree. That's true. I like to make everybody feel horrible. But okay, okay, okay. So... so I, I remember thinking like, you know what? No one is gonna make any actionable decisions on what he just said, so I'm just gonna leave it alone. And then afterwards, I went up to Dave. After the meeting, I go up to Dave. And I say, Dave, you know, I used to write cross-domain solutions. And what you said is actually like this, this, and this. I corrected him. And he goes, well, I'm the guy with the CASSP, which is a cyber certificate. And I went, okay, oh, watch no. this. So I went back to college. Has somebody ever made you so mad that you've that gotten you would, a degree from it? No, I would say I've experienced that. <laughs> Did you find Dave again, though? He was actually fired before I got my degree. But I, oh. I was, I was, That's you a know, vindicating. And Accenture paid for it. I, I loved working for Accenture. Uh, you know, I, I went and got that cyber degree, and I thought, like, yeah, I'm going to get that cyber degree. And you know what's what's great about getting a degree in cybersecurity as a software, uh, as, as a computer programmer? Yeah. What's great is that a lot of times you do something and then you, you give it to the cyber guys and the cyber guys say no, right? I mean, I could be a cyber guy if all you do is say no, right? <laughs> but now I know what they're looking for. Now I can take all of this cyber information, I can put it on a plate and I give it all to them and I say, what's it gonna take to get you to say yes? And that's something that is absolute gold. So now I've turned the cyber guys from an adversary, those, those guys who are always saying no, so you know what, let's be partners. Let's work together to get this software deployed. So you're like that, you're like that annoying data guy whisperer, basically. You know um, how to speak their language? Yeah, well, that, I think that's really important. That's, that's something I mm -hmm. did at Accenture, you know, talking about speaking a language. 
I was one of the few developers who had military experience, and we were working on this project. Real quick, Accenture. Mm -hmm. Accenture. Accenture. Mm -hmm. Can you, for the audience, what is the company? What is a the role? Accenture is a very large consulting company. Mm -hmm. uh, it's um, no different than Booz Allen or Lidos, and there's a branch called Accenture Federal Services, and we help the U.S. military and other clients solve their problems. Okay. And sometimes those are solved kinetically, and sometimes they're solved with software. Gotcha. So, um, <clears throat> Yeah, the uh, God, I don't remember what I was talking about with Accenture. Oh my God! <laughs> you were talking I, about you, uh, speaking the language. Yeah, of people. speaking the, the language. language. You had military experience. Yes. So yes. Uh, UTAMs and the degree. I did. So let me tell you about UTAMs. All right. So imagine you're in Iraq, right, and people are shooting mortars at you. UTAMs is like an acronym for something. Yeah, un unattended massant something. Okay. <laughs> so yeah, something it's an acronym for a uh, yeah. weapon. Okay. So, so people are shooting mortars at you. Well, what if we could detect where that mortar was launching by the sound of someone dropping that mortar round into the tube and thump? We can detect that sound. And when that mortar lands, we can detect that sound as well. So now we have POO, point of origin, and with POI, point of impact. So we were working on integrating this thing called UTAMs, and this is all public knowledge. We were integrating UTAMs <laughs> okay. with Ageon, which is our premier intelligence surveillance reconnaissance or ISR software. Okay. And let me tell you something. <clears throat> the developers, you know, there's four UTAMs units, they're basically big microphones that you set up around your, your base, your mm -hmm. forward operating base. And the developers are going, well, you know, if one of these sensors goes down, we need to we need to like throw a warning that one of them's down, so we're gonna make the system yellow as an icon. Well, there's four sensors, there's four corners to your base. If one of those sensors goes down, you're at 75%, so you're yellow, right? You're redder than red. You're like crimson, because now you have a sector that isn't covered. So one of the things I said to these developers is, hey, when a sensor goes down, when a UTAM sensor goes down, we need to throw a red warning and say, hey, someone needs to get out there and fix that sensor, and we need to get gun trucks out there to cover that sector, because now we have one sector that isn't being watched. Right. So that's that's the advantage of kind of speaking the language. Not a lot okay. of developers. Can I, I, wait, I want to drill down. Okay, first of all, two yeah. things, okay? I had a guy email me before, and he said that if you ever want to know what branch of the military somebody comes from, there's different tells. And he said, for Army, it's abbreviations. And oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> Acronyms for everything. Yeah, Jesus Bob, Christ. Bob, okay. Yeah. No one. Number two. Wait. I'm just curious on the technology. Mm -hmm. what, you said that these things. What is the goal? You listen for sound, and then you can figure out like the distance to a mortar or something. Or? Absolutely. So all you need, if you have, you have four microphones, and those microphones are listening for the sound. In of each of these mortar. sectors. Yeah, this is the sectors, sectors you're talking about. Okay. Yeah. And so when you hear the sound thump of that mortar, you can now transmit that information. You can triangulate it. You can transmit that information to a camera system that we had on a device called a P-TITS uh, or an aerostat. <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, don't laugh. Think of it like a balloon. It's a <laughs> balloon that floats up in the air, helium field balloon, has a bunch of cameras, a bunch of sensors on it. Okay. So as soon as these UTAMs units hear that thump, they swivel their cameras toward the point of origin. All right, and now, oh, look, Daddy L. Batty is running away from that, from that mortar tube. That's super interesting. Yeah. There's um this is super random. There's a part of your there's a part of your brain that's super important for like your orienting reaction. Mm -hmm. What's the this might be way too esoteric. What's the orienting system within the balloon, whatever you call it? So you have multiple GPS units on the balloon. Yeah. Uh, at the at the nose, at the rear, at the top, at the bottom, and at the sides. And so you can kind of figure out where you are in space because this aerostat, some there are as big as 76 meters. Yeah. And they're a mile up in the air. Well, yeah, 500 some feet up in the air, almost a mile. 1.6 kilometers for those at home, right? And so it's floating, you know, a mile above the air, right? Okay. And so the top might actually be above the bottom, you know, at any given time. Yeah. And the cameras are all gimbaled. So they're just kind of floating in space and they're holding their position because there's electronics the gimbling, that keep them stable, yeah. stabilization. Yeah. But it was a very important piece of, uh, piece of kit because once we, once we hear that thump, pump, thump, we have radar that can go up here comes a mortar round. And now we can decide, are we going to shoot this down? 
because we have a system called the CRAM. There's another, there's another <laughs> acronym, Counter uh, Rocket uh, Artillery and Mortar, yeah. CRAM system. The CRAM system sees that incoming mortar and attracts it, and if it detects it, it's going to land in a populated area that we've decided to protect, we'll shoot it down. Is this, this sounds very similar to um, also, we spoke a little bit about bef uh, yeah. this before the show, and I understand there's some things you can't talk about, you can't talk about. Yeah. But it sounds kind of similar to the Iron Dome. It, it you absolutely pinpoint it, rocket, yeah. figure out if it's going to land a populator, you intercept it. Is it like and similar? Is it the same system where it like explodes in air to stop it? Or? So yes, so uh, you're very you're you're absolutely correct. It's a 20 millimeter uh, shell, and you see these on uh, these systems. It almost looks like R2D2 with a gun sticking out of it. And on Navy ships, they're called a phalanx. And this system looks for uh, incoming missiles, and it'll shoot down an incoming missile. It'll just put a wall of lead. So when these rounds get close to the target, yeah, they'll explode, and they'll put up uh, shrapnel. And all you got to do is damage the missile enough to knock it off course or right. blow it up, and yeah. that's it. But you're absolutely correct. It's very similar to the Iron Dome. Its range isn't as good, but it is a little bit cheaper. That's the trade-off. If you had to guess, yeah. what do you think happened in... Um I'm trying to think. I think this was in Syria, in southern Syria, uh, a month yeah, or two ago. At, uh, oh, my God. I forget the darn name of the outpost. I want to say Outpost 22. Um, so from what Could I understand. Could you ground us in what that was? Just oh, so I'm sorry. Just so people yeah. are not aware. Yeah. Because I don't know. So what was Syria? I think we have a base in, it's in, it's in southern Syria, I think, right? Or an outpost. Right on the border between Jordan and Syria. Yeah. And somehow a drone. A drone. Got and through drone. and exploded. And were there was it three service three, killed? Three, uh, three armor reserve soldiers. Were three killed. American soldiers. Yeah. Three American soldiers. Yeah, Which ordinarily, if everything is working properly, I'd imagine you'd have a ton of forewarning. You'd have the ability to shoot it down. If, if you have a system there. Yeah. Yeah. So we, what we don't know is we don't know if they had a system, a CRAM system there. Mm -hmm. And also, apparently, during the attack, uh, there was an American drone that was flying fairly close to the incoming Iranian drone. Mm -hmm. And so the operators... So I guess we did have a system there. The operators couldn't figure out which, which was which. was which. They were just too close. And yes, there are transmitters on American drones that say, hey, I'm a friendly, don't shoot me. But it ranges like that. So it was just so far out that it was hard to tell hard which to transmission tell. Which was coming from which location. Which, which drone was the actual bad guy. So okay. you might have a sensor, but the CRAM might not necessarily be able to uh, be that surgical. For those drones that are attacking people, are these yeah. drones typically kamikaze drones, or do these drones have like a payload that they drop or launch and then? That's a very good question. They are primarily kamikaze drones. Okay. Um, the I think they call them UCAVs. The the kind of drone here's another app. <laughs> the kind of drone that flies above the battlefield and releases micro mun munitions. We really, as far as I know, we really haven't seen that uh, displayed by insurgents in Iraq. And uh, I'm sorry. In, well, actually, technically, they are in Iraq and Syria, and um, and uh, Yemen. Uh, it, they're mainly just one-way kamikaze drones. You're also seeing cruise missiles. You're seeing ballistic missiles. Hmm. You know, Israel got the first space kill, ever. First space kill ever. So using like space systems. Using an F-35, a, uh, a Houthi sect launched a ballistic missile toward Israel, and Israel had an F-35, F F which is an American fighter plane. I was say, is that a plane? Everybody. <laughs> I don't know a, any of these plane. acronyms. You know what? And that's why you invited me on here, right? <laughs> yeah. I will be more than happy to educate you, right? <laughs> Canada actually just recently bought the F-35. They're going to replace their F-18s with F-35s, and We're they made a great those. decision. Awesome. And uh, so now the F-35 detected the ballistic missile launch. It kind of got close to space. It fired a, a, a missile at the incoming missile and it destroyed that ballistic missile in flight. And that's proof that the F-35 is a good system. It works. It can be used effectively. I'm curious. Wait, when you mm -hmm. say that, did you did the F-35 mm -hmm. detect it and do it? Or is this like a mesh network? It, it's a mesh network. Okay, okay. There, there but still, the capability And so the to spatial okay, part okay. was the plane or were there like spatial satellites? The, the plane fired a missile that went up into space and hit that missile. Ah, there okay, is a okay. system called SIBRS. There is another acronym for it. <clears throat> Do you guys like name your kids? Like if you named a kid, <laughs> would you be like Ron? And then would you be thinking about like all the acronyms you can make of his name? I probably would do that. <laughs> uh, but Sibber? again, I'm a, I'm, a really, I'm a really good trailer to a really bad movie. So I don't really foresee that happening anytime soon. <laughs> Getting to perform the physical act that would result yeah. in such a thing. Um, <clears throat> but the, uh, the SIBRS system is space-based infrared system. And these are, it's a constellation of four satellites that just float above the Earth. And they look down at the Earth and they look for infrared signatures of rocket launches. 
And so with this system, we can go, oh, these guys just popped off a missile. Here's an infrared signature. It's almost instant. And the Space Force actually handles these guys. It's a separate, it is, uh, there, there's actually an entire, um, they don't call them division, deltas. There's an entire delta <laughs> yeah. of the Space Force that just works with the Cyber system. And I've, I've worked with the Space Force before. I made a video about these guys, why they're so essential to uh, American air sovereignty and actually the, the world. You know, we, we work with Canada, protecting Canada's airspace. True. And it, the Space Force, it's the ultimate high ground. You know, they are designed to deny our adversaries access to the high ground, the ultimate high ground, and then assist other units that need to use space to figure out where the bad guys are and what they're doing. Hmm. I feel like um, a lot of this is going to be me just asking you random questions. I'm super fascinated. I, I, I'd um, love to hear them. Real quick, though, uh, I just realized you didn't technically introduce yourself. Oh, For those yeah. That yeah, yeah actually, give you your you're gift. just like a random guy with a fedora here in Miami in front of the street who happens to know a lot of military acronyms. I, I was waiting for the transition. Played too many Splinter yeah. Cell games. Yeah, introduce yourself so people know who you are and everything. Yeah, go for it real quick. So my name is Ryan Macbeth. I'm a open source intelligence analyst. I uh, spent 20 years in the military, mostly as a heavy weapons and anti-tank infantryman. And then uh, while serving, I got a degree in computer science, a master's in engineering, and I went to work doing what's called C4ISR software. C4ISR stands for Command Control Computers. Command Control, <laughs> Command Control Computers. Uh, oh my goodness, how can I? Communications, Command okay. Control Communications Computers, Intelligence Surveillance Reconnaissance. So, and actually, sometimes there's a C5 ISR, which says cyber. As well, so okay. Pop that on. There. I only know up to C two <laughs> command and control. So command all the other C's that, are too much for me. I, I so. didn't used C's, to be until you know, relatively so. recently. Mm -hmm. So I started doing C four ISR software. While doing that, I created a programming channel on YouTube, where I taught people how to pass job interview questions on YouTube. And then when the I had about five thousand subscribers, you know. And then when the war in Ukraine kicked off, I made two videos. One video about why Ukraine had been the subject of cyber attacks. And a second video on why Russian tank turrets pop off their holes. And I, I went from 5,000 viewers to almost 100,000. I was like, oh, okay, this is what you want. Okay, wait, why do they pop off their holes? So the crew can get out if they get hit or what? <laughs> Absolutely not. It's, oh. it's, it's horrible what yeah. happens. Really. <laughs> My bad. Okay. So, <laughs> no. so I, if, you, if you take a look at this can of liquid death, right? So this is the turret on your tank, right? Okay. Now, on a Russian tank... Uh, anything T62. Uh, the I know T these names. Very good. Ha <laughs> ha. You know, T62, T64, T72, T80, T90. Abram Actually. is the American one, right? Correct. Okay. Correct. Oof. So you have a turret, and beneath that turret is a magazine. Imagine that's this can. All right. Now, all of the shells for that tank are loaded around this magazine in a, in a carousel. Because it's machine-loaded, right? It's machine-loaded. Absolutely correct. It is a machine-loaded gun. Now, the reason why is that number one, you can have three crewmen instead of four. American tanks use a 19-year-old with a strong arm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Bring it down to three crewmen allows you to have theoretically more tanks. more tanks. Absolutely. And you can make the tank lower to the ground because you don't have to make it as tall to make, make up for the guy who's standing and loading the shells. And what did Russia intend to fight in? Russia intended to fight in a nuclear, biological, and chemical environment. When World War III occurred, they were going to be using nuclear weapons, and we were going to be using nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. Now, you're fighting in a nuclear environment. What happens when you open that gun breach? Radiation gets on? Shine. You get the shine. Radiation. Okay. Okay. Right? So now, what if you just eliminate that human loader? Just have the machine do it. You don't have to worry about the machine getting radiation. But if all the shells are in a circle up here and it gets hit... You get a very big explosion, You get a right? very big explosion, but here's the deal. The T-72, Russia's premier battle tank, or most, most produced, I would say, battle tank. I don't say premier. The T-72 is about eh, two-thirds, maybe half the size of the Abrams, the American tank. Well, back in the 1970s, back in the 1980s, you were worried about incoming gunfire from an American tank. Mm -hmm. So what do you do? You make yourself smaller. Now, and it made sense. That's a trade-off. It's not a design flaw. People said, oh, the, the T-72, it has a fatal flaw. It's a smaller hitbox. It's a smaller hitbox. But now, what do we have that we didn't have back in the 70s? We have the Javelin and tank targeting. missile. And that thing has a computerized brain. And it doesn't care. Mm. 
Mm. It doesn't care how small you are. So the main benefit is mute. You no, put the moot. Moot, yeah, you yeah. put the track gates on that tank. Safety trigger. Whew, it dives right down on top of it. When you're for a missile that's targeting something like that, mm -hmm. um, is it how does it do? Like, do you paint it with a laser and then it follows a laser? Does it do you par target it before? Does it look for a picture? How intelligent is the? That's an excellent question. For something, some missiles use lasers where you'll shoot a laser and say, "Hey, follow this laser beam." What disadvantage does that give you? Straight line. Well, if you can't straight line, and if you lose the laser, you <laughs> with what, what is there on a battle? What is there a lot of on a battlefield? Obstacles, debris, and and dust, smoke, and smoke, and yeah. absolutely. Now, Russia uses a system called the Coronet, which is similar to American anti-tank missiles, but it is laser guided in kind of a weird way. The the launcher projects a grid. And the missile kind of looks back at the grid to figure out where it is. Okay. You know, so like the, the spark. Yeah, as the guy's yeah, guiding yeah. it. All right. Now we also have a weapon called a tow, which is the weapon that I've used. Uh, tube, <clears throat> tube launched, optically uh, tube launched, uh, T O, tube launched, optically guided, <laughs> optically <laughs> tracked, wire guided, T O W. Okay. So this sends all of there's there's a, a flare on the back of the tow in infrared. And it is sending its location back to the ITAS. Again, another acronym, which is a, it's, it's a, think of it like a, a pair of binoculars that can see thermal signatures, right? Okay. So it's sending that information back and it's figuring out where it is in space from that little flare. Now, Javelin's a little bit different. The Javelin has a smart warhead or a smart seeker where it recognizes, okay, this is the thermal signature of the tank, this is the picture of the thing I'm supposed to go kill. And now, so the computer's in the missile. And itself. It's in the missile. As soon as you fire that thing, you can run like you drop that tube, take the clue, the command launch unit, another acronym, take the clue and run. Or pop another missile on fire again. Now. And you can forget about it because it'll forget, forget the you rest of it. You can just run. Out. And the okay. missile will do the rest of the work. Now, every time you see someone fire a javelin, I want you to think of that scene in Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Which one? Which one? Where <laughs> the Ferrari crashed through the window and landed, you know, Cameron's father's Ferrari crashed through the window and wrecked itself at the bottom of the house. Because the Javelin costs about $100,000 a pop. Okay. So every time you think of it, every time you see a Javelin, You're thinking you got think of a Ferrari just wrecking. Think okay, of, two other questions. Yes. You talk about ballistic and you mm -hmm. talk about cruise missile. Ballistic mm -hmm. missile means that once it's shot, it's unguided, right? It just comes and goes. Like, yeah, follows the, it follows a ballistic path. There may be mm -hmm. some guidance at the terminal phase. Okay. Where as it's getting closer, it's going, okay, where do I, especially like an anti ship ballistic missile? Okay. It might turn on a radar and go, okay, where is this? Oh, there it is. Let me, I can maneuver a little bit. A little bit. Okay. So they will have s surfaces for maneuvering like on a little, ballistic missile? On a small, yeah. They'll, they'll have, it can make small corrections. But cruise missile. Is, when regard. you think of a ballistic missile, yeah. I want you to think of a pitcher in Philadelphia throwing a baseball. And he's throwing that baseball all the way to Los Angeles, right inside the strike zone. That's how accurate our math for ballistic missiles are now. It's kind of like a pitcher in Philadelphia throwing a baseball all the way to Los Angeles and, and is, getting in the strike box. Is the math done at the point of like launch or is the math done by the missile in the air or is it both? Actually, I don't know. <laughs> that's that's actually a good question for Jake Bro. Okay. I'd imagine the coordinates are loaded onto the missile and the missile's just told, hey, this is your telemetry, this is where we're supposed to go. And, and then it, the it figures can out. Yeah, the missile changes. can figure that out. But <laughs> that's then, that's a question for Jake Bro, who's okay. another YouTuber. Cruise missiles are more maneuverable like once they're already in flight or what's Absolutely. Okay. So a cruise missile is essentially was the first robotic killer drone. Right? That's that's really what a cruise missile is. And these the first cruise missiles, uh, they took a look at uh, satellite imagery. It was satellite imagery was loaded into the missile, and the missile would take a picture of the ground and go, "Okay, I'm not there yet. Oh, I need to I need to make a correction and move over here. Hmm. Need to make another correction and move over here." And it would actually get to its target by looking at various landmarks. That's during the first Gulf War. You noticed you've seen missiles fly straight down roads. There's famous footage from CNN where they're giving a remote and the missiles are flying right outside. Well, it's because it was using the road going, okay, this is, okay, I'm almost here, I'm almost here. Oh, I got to turn left here. So cruise missiles can actually guide themselves. They're a lot slower. They fly lower to the ground, but the disadvantage of a ballistic missile is you can predict where it's going, and if you can predict where it's going, you can shoot it down. Right. Right. 
a cruise, you can't because it, it might be a little bit harder. You have to detect it, right? It flies right. low to the ground, so it's you know below the horizon you know, with your radar. So it might come up on you a little bit faster. It can also maneuver. It can go, okay, um, and this might be pre-programmed, but it'll say, all right, uh, turn. All right, we we have this can of liquid. There there is this can of liquid death represents. You know, a surface area missile battery. There's another surface area missile battery. So I'm the cruise missile. I'm going to go past the microphone. I'm going to go in between these two liquid death things. And that's, yeah, they, there is a little bit of maneuverability there. Okay, so it, can f it basically has like a defense of like an anti-missile system in that it can like somewhat dodge against what might be firing at if it. If you know what, what you're... If yeah, you know if that If you know that those things exist. Okay, okay, right. gotcha. It, so maybe some modern missiles might have the ability to, to make a decision. I don't know of any of that. But ballistics don't have the ability to kind of like maneuver mid-flight. No, to the there degree are. That cruises. For the term hypersonic missile, uh, is that Mach six? It, it's well, if you want to get technical, almost every missile, every, every ballistic missile is a hypersonic missile. There's a name specifically where I think hypersonic missile is supposed to only refer to missiles that can also uh, make maneuverability decisions. Absolutely. Supposed, yeah, You're because absolutely. there's a huge debate over the is it the Kinzel. Russian missile that they Whether claim. Whether it's hypersonic. Yeah, it's they claim really it's a hypersonic. ballistic missile with some terminal capabilities. Yeah. But then the Russians, the pro-Russians, uh, or the pro-Russian bots, depending yeah. how you view it on Twitter, will come out and argue that it absolutely is because of its speed. But then, as you said, yeah, everything everything's moving at that speed you for rockets. You Mach 5, you know what's hypersonic? The space yeah. shuttle. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. So, but there are hypersonic glide vehicles, which are kind of interesting. Because now you can move at Mach 5, and you can also maneuver a little bit, right? And as you're going, getting to your terminal, you're, you have to slow down a little bit because you got to go, okay, I need to make some fine-tuned corrections for this target here. So that's when you might be able to shoot one down. But the scary part with hypersonic missiles are the glide vehicles. That could, they don't go orbital, you know. They're just kind of gliding suborbital, you know, and you don't know which way they're going to turn. It's a lot harder to shoot down. And if you're trying to engage something in the terminal phase, you've already lost the game. Like it, it, that missile has the initiative because it's terminal means it's moving so fast that uh, your ability to it's about to hit something. Yeah, you know, okay. you're, you're, and now you know if you're if you're dealing with a head-on shot, it might be a little bit easier. All you gotta do is get in front of it, right? Mm -hmm. If something's going Mach five and you're going Mach four, that missile's gonna have a bad day. Yeah, right. But if you're trying to shoot from the oblique, you're trying to shoot from the side, then you might be trying to catch up with this thing, and it might not work. Yeah, right. and yeah. I think um, for there's a there's kind of like a back and forth in terms of uh, you see this especially with the old mm -hmm. wars where these leaps in technology all of a sudden enable a whole new form of operation or a whole new military offensive that yeah. previously was un unheard of and it, and it renders all of your opponent's defenses obsolete basically. And or the, vice versa of like jumps in defensive. Yeah, yeah. And the, the scary part about those hypersonic maneuverable missiles is that all of a sudden a whole bunch of traditional min missile interception systems have become completely obsolete because for a ballistic stuff, as you said, my understanding is once a ballistic missile fires in like a couple seconds, you basically know where it's going to land. Mm -hmm. And the interception, uh, especially because a lot of these things are sub, are like basically atmospheric, very mm -hmm. easy to intercept. But for the hypersonic stuff, if it's sub atmosphere and if it can maneuver during flight, now whatever you're shooting has to be that much more sophisticated and you have to have that much more warning and you have to have that much more trafficking and it becomes very, very, very complicated. What's the answer to that? Uh, nuking them before. Preemptive. No, I'm just that that Preemptive would be one. Blast. That would be one thing. I, I got you the right shirt. Lasers. <laughs> lasers. Lasers. Answer to that. We used wow. to have a laser system on a 747. Like lasers to... Like, sorry, just explain. lasers. Do you shoot lasers at the missile and you heat the missile up and you destroy it in flight? We used to have this mm. an airborne system. It was on a 747 that had a big laser in the nose. And like 15 years ago, we dropped it because we were dealing with global war on terror. And I bet we're regretting that now, right? But you know, if I had some ham, I'd have some ham and eggs. If I had some eggs, right? right. We made a decision and. Yeah, you know, now we're kind of paying that price. Although it, it feels like from a military point of view, mm -hmm. um, and I've gotten into small arguments about this, um, <laughs> as somebody that knows nothing, so the best types of arguments, <laughs> that uh, <clears throat> you run into an issue where your defensive systems feel like they need to be so much more sophisticated sometimes than the offensive systems. So you run into this area of, could you simply overwhelm a defensive system, like on October 7th, by shooting 7,000 cruddy rockets where, 
what does a custom rocket cost? My guess is going to be in the hundreds of dollars to make one. It's just a pipe. Thousand dollars. Yeah. Maybe, pipe, yeah. What they're one of the things they're doing in Israel is they use sugar and fertilizer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Pipe, but the fertilizer. interception, the system, the maintenance, the employees to run it, all of that is already ex incredibly expensive. And that's before you get into each of those inter uh, interceptor missiles, which are uh, two orders of magnitude, sometimes more expensive than what you're intercepting. What's interesting is the IDF never gives out the cost of anything. Sure. So. <laughs> We, no one's been able to figure out how much the Iron Dome system costs per missile. Some say it's $20,000, some say it's $100,000 uh, yeah. per shot. Nobody really knows because they kind of hold that close to the vest. Mm -hmm. Do you think it's possible to aim a laser with sufficient strength at a hypersonic missile such that you could bring it down in a reliable manner? Because that's, that's a Not long. today, but we were getting to that capability 15 years ago. And I think it was the USS Ponce that tested it out. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the USS Ponce is a, is a command and control ship that uh, it, we actually put, I think it was a 15 megawatt laser on this thing. And we were successfully shooting down drones. We could other, do other neat stuff, like let's say there's terrorists coming at us in small boats. Well, do your rules of engagement. All right, well maybe let's not kill these terrorists. Let's maybe, uh, hit the engine with the laser. We can track the engine, just hit the engine, now they're dead in the water, right? Now that we can get a helicopter over there, we can rescue these guys, we can bring them on board, and we can do some interrogation, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so the USS Ponce was, was a revolutionary uh, tool uh, that we were developing. And again, that kind of got that pushed back. Mm -hmm. uh, the whole idea is that eventually we will have lasers on American warships. We just have to have the power you know, the, the power availability to do that. And right now, the Arleigh Burke class destroyers that we have, it's, it, they're, they're thick boys now. <laughs> like they used to call them small boys. They're thick boys. They put so much other crap on these destroyers mm -hmm. that, uh, that they, they uh, it's like they got a, a butt lift or something, you know, they're, they're bulbous now, right? <laughs> and we literally can't plug another thing into this Arleigh Burke. We need a whole new destroyer to move into the future and uh, have extra power to operate some of these lasers and sensors. Hmm. Something I'm really curious about is, um, for the, oh, I need to not say this. Okay, I am curious about it though. Mm -hmm. The, um, from 2000 to 2022, mm -hmm. 2001 to 2022, it seemed like the battlefield across the planet was changing between one of state actors mm -hmm. and non-state actors, which I'm sure you would say also like, introduces a whole unique set of challenges. You're not marching one army against another. You can't hold states responsible for actions. The types of tactics and things that are deployed are gonna be dramatically yeah. different on both sides. And I thought it was very interesting that it feels like on the back of all of the world tension, China and Taiwan, Russia and Ukraine, yeah. that there's always this big potential, I don't wanna say World War III, but state actor versus state actor conflict looming. Mm -hmm. But in the meantime, all of the conflict has been these non-state actors, so ISIS or the 50 million groups that exist in Syria right now, no. or you know Hamas, whether you consider a state actor or not, uh, Hezbollah, the Houthis. But something that's kind of interesting to me is when you look at the, um, I guess, when the Russia-Ukraine conflict started, yeah. moving into the future, what, what, do, what do state actor versus state actor fights look like? Because I feel like if I were to just read headlines or take a really quick cursory glance of Russia versus Ukraine, it sounds like non-state actors fighting each other. When I hear like drones are flying around and these very small units of people and these like advanced like electronic warfare stuff, doesn't feel like in the beginning stages of the war when it was position, uh, maneuverable rather than position. Yeah, uh, yeah. What, do you, what do you think that looks like? Do you think that, um, what are the differences between those two things? Okay. And then, yeah, go. A big so question. Now, <laughs> yeah. now we're talking about the difference between Lisco and COIN. Okay. Oh, I hate no. Just do more acronyms, okay. all right? I need, we need a board. I should have given you a Lisco. Limit. You have to pay me $10 for a new acronym. Okay, I'm going to be rich by the end of this podcast. Okay, Lisco and... Okay, Large-scale go, go. combat operations. Okay. Lisco. COIN, counterinsurgency operations. For almost 20 years, America and our allies, our partners in the global war on terror, we were fighting the coin fight. Right? We're, we are going to get these bad guys and bring them to justice. Now, about four or five years ago, the Army started pivoting to Lisco. Lisco. A new threat rises in the East, right? and that's not going to be the Lisco fight. Now we're dealing with the tyranny of distance. We're dealing with 6,300 miles, or uh, what is that in kilometers? Uh, 10,000 
some kilometers to, yeah. to put it in to Canadian reference, right? We're going at 6,300 miles. Do we gotta we gotta move our missiles in our system? 6,300 miles to go fight the Chinese or fight the I shouldn't say the Chinese. The Chinese are great. The Chinese Communist Party, the PLA, hmm, not so much. The People's Liberation Army Navy, not crazy about them either. So we have to move all of that stuff. So we're going to see the tyranny of distance. We're going to see it being very difficult to get logistics from one place to another. Another thing we're going to see, we're going to see a lot of people bleeding to death. And that's because the medevacs of old are done. Hmm. You know, you watch those Vietnam War movies, I need a medevac in this sector, right? And we could get a medevac to someone very quickly because for the most part, we own the air. That would be a helicopter be a in helicopter. this case, right? Yeah. Be a medical evacuation Not the drones helicopter. that you were telling me about the other day. Yeah, it'll be a medical evacuation helicopter. And we can usually get a casualty to a hospital within an hour. If you get, it's called the golden hour. You get them into that hospital within an hour, they stand a very good chance of living through this whole event. Now tell me how we get a casualty on an island in the Pacific to a hospital ship. Well, my... It would tough. It would have to be whatever aircraft carrier, whatever... Navy is deployed would have medical facilities on board. You're saying that you think that medically marked vehicles would be targeted by... Absolutely. Russia's doing it. Medically marked vehicles will be targeted. They will be targeted. Number one... Like to have the rules of war essentially changed no, in the modern era? No, they're just being ignored. I'm curious on that. Do you think that Russia ignores rules of war? I would largely agree that they exist outside of the boundaries of what we do. But do you think that's because they can get away with it with Ukraine? Do you think they would necessarily behave the same in an alternate world where there was an enemy that could punish them for that? That's a good question. I think that there are, there are probably some Russian officers who want to do the right thing. Uh, but then they also they have that, 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 competing, that Pressure. competing priority of you need to take this city. You know, but we you know, we can't shell the city because there's there's people inside it. You know, mm -hmm. Tavarish, you must take the city, right? I don't think they say Tavarish anymore. But <laughs> I'm back. just I'm curious because like <laughs> I'm not even thinking in terms of like the officers that want to do the right thing. I'm thinking in terms of people. I think that even when the state seems crazy, yeah. there's usually the, there's statements made to the public. But when you look at what they're actually doing, they're very careful to adhere to the, even people like Iran. Um, when we uh, assassinated Soleimani or when there was there was something else within the past year, I don't remember what it was, but Iran will say America will pay. We're going to do we have blah, blah, blah. Yeah. But they're very precise and they'll only target one thing. They don't go all out because they know that if they did, I imagine they would get annihilated. So there's like this very careful back and forth, regardless of what the public posturing yeah. is to where they're very careful about what they target. So for Russia targeting Ukraine, right now I think the world understands that NATO forces are never gonna be present in Ukraine such that that crossfire triggers some Article 5 stuff and something happens and well, you don't, you disagree? <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah, oh, I was actually talking with my old boss today who was talking about uh, the, the French seriously are considering, the French and the Poles are seriously considering sending troops into Ukraine. To well, do a defensive. Now, this didn't come from Twitter. This uh -huh. came from my old boss. True. I guess uh, they could. Although <clears throat> my understanding is that if it's a non-NATO nation and there are NATO, or there are countries with NATO troops, but they're not within their own territory, you can't trigger Article Five for that. I think. Right. I, that's certainly that. I am not a lawyer. Mm -hmm. I'm sure there's there. Is but, France and Poland in NATO? Yeah, but the the you know, yeah, but one of the things if, that if I, you were to attack like France or Poland, you, it would be over. It would be over, right? Yeah. But if they yeah. send in troops in like a defensive position in Ukraine, is that uh, also triggering anything? That that's why you need to bring a lawyer on here. My my understanding is if if you're it's oh. only if your troops or something happened to you um, within your country within your bounds or something or like yeah, if, if you were to kill a U.S. soldier. Well, or if they sent French troops into like Russian areas right now, or even Russian controlled areas. Like if they sent French troops into anywhere near Crimea, would that also be a trigger of Article 5? All I know so is I remember reading about this a while ago. Who don't know? Well, hold on. I remember reading about this because it, it was a big debate on whether um, if, if French troops or if somebody went into Ukraine, I don't think you could trigger. I'll look it up because I got my thing right here. So yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, one thing that that uh, I, I could say is that if you want to get technical, Russia's already attacked Poland. I, I did a video yeah, about a year ago where uh, a Russian uh, cruise missile landed yeah, about yeah. five kilometers inside of Poland. And people said, no, 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 it was a Ukrainian missile. It was a Ukrainian uh, interceptor. And sometimes they can turn around, but they don't tend to do backflips. 
right, right. and go all the way around and, and land kilometers away. Um, <clears throat> but I think that was one of those things where everyone said, you know what, we don't really want to be fighting Russia, so let's just pretend this whole thing didn't happen. Right, because right. we don't really want like the like the the pressure when you guys were talking about like they get annihilated, for example, or like you were saying like you, you know like a Lisco war, like the large scale. Mm -hmm. You, you want to be cautious because there's an enemy that can punish you. The question for me is like what's what specifically would be the punishment between like say like China and America if China did something, other than like would it just be like targeting bases and stuff like that? Is that kind of what you mean by punishing each so other? So right now, the way that it works is there is a, generally speaking, there will be a proportional response if somebody does something that they're not supposed to do. So if you, if we've got people operating in Syria or if there's that outpost or whatever and somebody bombs it, we might bomb something of a similar military importance, basically. And it seems kind of silly and dumb, like we're playing games, but what it communicates to the world is that everybody's still playing by the same like it's a rules. it's still tit for tat. Yeah, which is really, really, really important because you don't want people feeling like, holy shit, we're on a runaway escalating ramp to World War III. The, a comparison, I'm sure you know the mm -hmm. Perun? Yeah, per per Perun. Yeah. I, I, you know, I don't know how to pronounce it either. Yeah. But, but he does, when, when, for instance, for the saber rattling for Russia's nuclear arsenal, you know, when you hear, for the public, it's very scary when you hear that Russia's moving nuclear weapons and they're, you know, uh, preparing launches or they're doing testing or whatever. And that seems scary to the public. But I think the message being sent to the rest of the world is while we're saber rattling, we're still doing everything in the open. You can see exactly where everything is. We're not hiding anything. So we're making the public scared. But for the people that know, for the military people, for the leaders, like we're still following all the rules that we're supposed to yeah. follow, which is we, important. We fire, I think, three. ICBMs every year. We uh, we do a test. We take a missile to Vandenberg, and uh, they have a test crew that actually launches this missile. And I would actually like to cover that one day. <laughs> do like a little thing. How and they it's basically a just like a flex of being like, just remember. No, it's basically like a. You know, first of all, the, the missiles they you have to shoot them because they'll they'll you know you, you test them. You test the inventory. Make yeah. sure mm -hmm. okay, this one's working. It's not necessarily a flex, but we get telemetry from it because we don't. We're not. This isn't a tow. Right, this isn't an anti-tank missile. Like we don't shoot that many of them, and they're expensive. So yeah, we shoot them just to get the telemetry, and we make sure okay, this lot is good. Let's, and then we're gonna rotate in another lot that was built in the 1970s, and we'll see if that one works. But mm -hmm. good thinking. I mean that that is a that is a one one thing that that you might some people might consider a uh, possibility is that, oh, we're going to flex. But really, it's we got to test these things. Yeah, right? one of the things that comes up a lot is uh, I'm of the uneducated opinion. Do you know who Kaufman is? Uh, like there's a Kaufman? No, no, no. Oh. I, should, I need to remember these names. No, there's a, there's a military analysis uh, guy or military analyst that I read, and he spoke a lot about Ukraine and Russia. Mm -hmm. And one of the opinions that I see given uh, by him and, and a couple other people is that the United States is truly the only country in the world that can do, you used a term earlier, Let's where you go. Uh, it's where you have like, multi-disciplined like different parts of your military all working together in multi-domain operations kind of yeah basically yeah where you, you've got your land uh mm -hmm. you've got your land ground uh or i'm sorry you've got your air ground like your space force everything. helping your yeah everything working together helping. and that um do, do you think there's any truth to the idea that the united states is the only country or nato is, or is the only group of people led by the united states that can coordinate warfare on that level or do you think that like Russia or China, given some military conflict, would also be able to coordinate at that level? It's it's almost certain that NATO is. I just got back from an exercise called Project Convergence Capstone Four, okay. which was a, I see I didn't use an acronym. I you didn't. That's good. Michael Kaufman was the guy's name also. Go so ahead. all right, you know, a finger can't do much damage on its own, but you take your fingers and the fingers of our allies, and you were, have them working together. Now they're a fist. You can do a lot more damage. Right? Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> Project Convergence Capstone 4 was all about having the Space Force and the Air Force and the Navy and the Army and the Marine Corps all talk to each other over common networks and share data and share data with our allies. Because we can't fight China's magazine. And by magazine, the depth of their missiles, how many missiles they have. We can't beat China with missile for missile. But you know what we can do is we can be smart about it. We can have an Australian Special Forces soldier on an island, and he sees a Chinese missile launcher, and then he radios to an American AWACS, which is a command and control plane. It's got a big radar dish on top. He radios the AWACS, and that AWACS has a guy on it that can say, that is a valid target. What, what's, what, um, what effectors 
do we have in the area that can actually target that Chinese missile battery? Oh, there is a, um, there's a Filipino HIMARS system that can fire at that target and still get away in time. So now we call that any sensor, any decider, any shooter. Now there's a term called kill chain. And in the, list, in the coin environment, in the counterinsurgency environment, we used a kill chain. We identified the target. We dispatched uh, resources to hit that target. Could you maybe just briefly explain what's the purpose of a kill chain in the coin? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the kill chain in the coin was we, uh, let's say we're trying to find Daddy L. Batty, right? So, all right, we got, we got info on the whereabouts of Daddy L. Batty. Yeah. All right, so now we, we dispatch. We dispatch a drone. All right, we're going to serve it. Oh, yeah, that's Daddy L. Batty. He's driving the same car. He's walking with a limp. His driver's using a cell phone that's been linked to the driver's account. That's definitely Daddy L. Batty. And we'll initiate the attack. We'll see what weapon systems we have in the area, and we'll vector those weapon systems in. All right, now let's take a look at the um, the environment. All right, is is school almost out? Are mm -hmm. there going to be kids on the street? What kind of weapons we do weaponeering? What kind of weapons do we have that can affect that particular vehicle? Right. So we have to do all those calculations, and we might finally say, okay, initiate, and we'll fire a hellfire at Daddy El Batty. That's what we could do in coin. We had the time. Now, in Lisco, fighting China, even fighting Russia, we can't do that. We can't spend time. We can't spend time, you know, tracking one target. Now we have a kill mesh. Yeah. Any sensor, any decider, any shooter. And you can put weapons effects on target. So that's, I know that I kind of, <laughs> I think I went off a little bit, but what's it, you said, I think you said, what's it going to look like? Well, Basically, look my, like yeah, the question is, can anybody really coordinate warfare we at can. the level besides us? We can. And I think one of the issues is that, you know, Russia has, has enough trouble doing what's called deconfliction. And that essentially means uh, figuring out where its aircraft are uh -huh. and where they need to go and clearing that airspace. And they've shot down some of their own planes. So th they haven't done that recently. So they've gotten better at deconfliction because they've had practice. Mm -hmm. And that, that's one of the big things. But one of the reasons we can operate uh, integrated a lot more effectively than our adversaries is that our adversaries might do the occasional exercise once in a while, but we're constantly doing exercises. You know, why did we go down to Chile for an exercise, well, because we work with the Chilean Navy, the Chilean Navy is now using unmanned surface vehicles mm -hmm. to figure out where Chinese fishing ships are. China has been going to Chile, and they've been fishing in Chile's waters. So Chile needs unmanned surface ships. They can't afford any satellites to go out and find find these Chinese ships, so they can vector the Chilean Coast Guard toward these Chinese ships. So we're always working with our uh, uh, our allies. Always. And that's really the only way is if you do it constantly and you practice and you establish those relationships, that's really the only way you can operate effectively as a team. I guess maybe this was your question and maybe uh, maybe this is just my question, but mm -hmm. does, like, for example, we've got NATO. Does BRICS have the capability for this type of, like, military uh, no, BRICS isn't even a real thing. BRICS okay. is bullshit. Uh, does Russia and China have enough of a relationship with each other where they could coordinate in this way that you're no. like outgriming? So I, I gotta tell you, Kyla, I think I think that that you have a very good question. And <laughs> yeah, Stephen, they're garbage. <laughs> and BRICS is an acronym. That's literally it. Yeah, we love acronyms here. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, Br BRICS is an acronym. So BRICS is it's basically like an economic consortium of Brazil. Uh, uh, China, uh, India, uh, PR, oh, oh, Russia, your IC, and S was South Africa, I believe. And so it's a consortium of, of five countries that we don't ever buy anything from other than China. Right. And they don't really particularly sell to each other. Um, maybe they could come up with some alliance, but Brazil is, we, have, we do exercises with the Brazilian military. I think they kind of know what side their, their bread is buttered on. Um, so that, it, it, it's a, it, it could, I guess, eventually become an alliance. But one of the issues is that of those five countries, South Africa, Brazil, China, India, and Russia, only one and a half of them actually have um, expeditionary militaries. Hmm. So here's why your question was so good. Or bad. <laughs> it was good. It was good. I am never going to let someone speak over you. Here's why it was so good. 
it's because there are four different kinds of armies. All right? You have expeditionary armies. These are armies that can, um, that can deploy and sustain. There's essentially only four and a half. The U.S., Great Britain, uh, France, Russia to an extent, and China's gaining that capability. So four and a half. When you say expeditionary, you mean deploy to another country deploy and logistics and supply and to maintain. Okay, Absolutely. Gotcha. Okay. Absolutely. And then you have defensive militaries. Most of the armies of Europe are defensive militaries. They're just there to protect their own country. They might have some expeditionary capability. Like let's say there's a, a disaster in East Timor, right? There's an earthquake in East Timor. They might be able to get an amphibious landing ship there. They got one, you know, and, and they'll help out. But for the most part, defensive armies. Then you have palace guard armies. Palace guard armies, well, what are they? They're designed to keep the leader in power, right? They're, 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 so most of the armies of the Arab world are palace guard armies. Right. And then you have def, um, internal security armies. Most of the armies of South America are internal security armies. They're there to supplement the police. So okay. what you have is Brazil, which has a, def, a defensive army, well, and a little bit, I would say, a defensive and a little bit of a uh, internal security army. And you have South Africa, which has a defensive and internal security army. And you have Russia, which has expeditionary capability, but that they're losing. And you have India, which is a defensive army. And you have China, which is trying to gain expeditionary ability. Okay, so they get into an alliance. Now what? How does Brazil get to the fight? They can't get there. They have short arms and short legs. <laughs> They can't get to the fight. They, they, don't, they don't have the legs to walk to the fight, right? right? They don't have the legs to get to the fight. And once they get there, they can't punch very far. Short arms, short legs. And most of those countries, with the exception of Russia, with the, the exception of China, you know, both Russia and China have short legs. They got long arms. They have missile capability. India has some missile capability, too. But Russia and China, they, they have a hard time getting to where they need to go and sustaining. Interesting. So you actually asked a very good question. Interesting. I thought it was a good yeah. question. I did agree. You? Okay. Yeah, I did. Oh, thanks. I wasn't okay. shedding on your question. I was shedding on bricks, <laughs> to be clear. <laughs> um, because it's, I argue with a lot of, you know the term tanky? It's like someone who. Um, very far left people who support they want, like, Stalin revolution. and all of, and yeah. Mao, oh. and they think they're good. And then, and that's How's like. How's that a, working out for them? Uh, well, I mean, they live in their own little reality, so still winning happy. every day, I guess, in their world. <laughs> um, okay, so in my mind, there yeah. are there are three conflicts. We're going to focus in on one of them, and then hopefully we get to all three of these. There's like kind of like three theaters that everybody's focused on. Yeah. Um, the first one is Russia-Ukraine, mm -hmm. obviously. It's been going on in a hardcore phase for like yeah. two years, really for like 10 years. Um, and then you've got, obviously, Israel, the mm -hmm. IDF, and Hamas is an ongoing conflict. And then there's the, the brewing, looming threat of China and Taiwan and yeah. whatever that will look like. Um, I'm 35. I've heard my whole life that something big is going to happen with China next year for probably like three decades now. So we'll see. Um, focusing in on Russia, Ukraine, because it relates to a lot of what we just talked about yeah. in terms of major power warfare and deploying and feeding armies and everything. Do you think actually here, starting from 2022, in your mind, what were the what were like the top three reasons that Russia's military seemed to underperform everybody's expectations? What do you think went wrong? Training, training, training. Okay, just the top three reasons. Um, you know, Russia has always been able to kind of bully its way into a situation, almost like a drunken boxer, right? Mm -hmm. They're gonna roll in. Look, you know, I I I I am not a prize fighter, right? But if I had to fight Mike Tyson, he's gonna knock my my head off, right? I might be able to outrun him. I might be able to bob and weave a little bit. This guy's going to floor me, right? Mm -hmm. So Russia might be like this drunken boxer. It's just rolling in, and it's going to smash a bunch of stuff, and eventually they're going to smash right through. But one of their big issues is that training is expensive. It's expensive. Right. And Russia used to have a mostly conscript army that's led by professional officers. And now they have kind of this hybrid army. They have some... Um, they have some conscripts, and they have a lot of kontraktniki, which are contractors. Like, there are people who sign a contract. Now, <clears throat> so that the, one of the issues is that they don't, just, they don't do enough actual training in tasks 
that they need to succeed on the battlefield. Is that because of like the contractor nature relationship it, of most of their hires? It's okay. expensive. Well, you got to pay for fuel. You got to pay for ammunition. Well, actually, I want to ask mm -hmm. a question yeah. particularly in that. So um, some of the flexibility you're granted with mm -hmm. things like the Wagner Group is you can do things without having your fingers on them. Yeah. Do you think that it, it significantly hampered Russia's ability to conduct war when it feels like, and this is, I, mm -hmm. I think this is the case, but maybe it's not, you can tell me, it feels like the people with the most experience doing Russian military operations weren't actually the Russia proper military. It was like people like the Wagner Group that mm -hmm. operated foreignly so much. Do you think that hurt their ability to conduct that war, that their most experienced people were there? Or do you think my perception is wrong on that? Or No, because I, that, that's actually, that's an excellent question. And Wagner, so kind of the, the difference, Wagner had some vehicles, but what Wagner had that the Russian military didn't have was a clear, I would say, non-commissioned officer leadership structure, even though it was a corporate, corporate structure. So one of the advantages that the West has with a lot of military engagements is guys like me. I'm a former, former platoon sergeant and a former first sergeant as well. So I, I often call myself, I am a... Burger, I am the Burger King drive through manager. <laughs> so if you look, if you think of an army platoon uh, as a Burger King, right? The, the lieutenant is the general manager, right? And I'm the, the, the drive through manager. And if the lieutenant has to go home, you know, if, the, if the, the Burger King manager has to go home because his kid is sick, I can close the store. Mm -hmm. You know, I know how to do that, right? So in a lot of Western armies, you have this professional core of non-commissioned officers, these sergeants, right? And these sergeants have a lot of experience. In order to get where I got as a, uh, a sergeant first class and later as a first sergeant, I had to go to multiple schools, which cost money and are weeks long, months long in mm -hmm. some cases. Right? One of the schools I was telling, uh, I was telling him about last night, it was called uh, Your Producer. It was, they actually called it Mancock. <laughs> Maneuver Advanced Non-Commissioned Officers Course. Ain't okay. no like, way. Wow, you guys are so Christian, you don't even know how bad that sounds. But uh, yeah, it was Maneuver ANOC. So this was an advanced, they, they call it something else now. But mm -hmm. um, the uh, I had to go to this school, and this school is months long, and you're doing graduate level work, writing papers and stuff like that. Well, Russia doesn't really have a system like that to advance their non-commissioned officers. And the whole idea is that Russia was centered around a mechanized centric system. All right? Almost everything Russia does is mechanized. They're always near their armored fighting vehicles, either the BMPs, BTRs, whatever. And the advantage of that is like, look, if you're never going more than 300 meters away from your vehicle, you really don't need those mid-level Burger King managers, those mm -hmm. NCOs to lead the maneuver element. Right? You're not going that far away. But if you're doing light infantry, you kind of need that. So what did Wagner do? Wagner did a lot of light infantry stuff. Did a lot of assaults, light infantry. And they had people who had experience just by being mercenaries who could act as those NCOs. I think that's one of the reasons that Wagner was so successful. Is they had people who had served as mercenaries who had experience and were allowed to lead small groups of people. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the Russian military, when your lieutenant gets killed, what do we do now? I don't know. Yeah. I guess we surrender. I mean, we go back. I don't know. Who's supposed to tell us to do what? One of the, um, we spoke about this a little bit last night, but looking at um, playing a lot of Daisy, <laughs> the video game, mm -hmm. Arma 2, people play as well, and then playing a lot of Eve. The um, It's funny when you look at the military stuff, how much of a crossover there is between how you conduct like warfare on the, in these games versus the real world, where things like communication structures and everything are vitally important. And if these things have a breakdown or if you can't coordinate, it doesn't matter how many people you have, it doesn't matter how effective the weapons are, you just, you're like fighting in the dark. Mm -hmm. And it's funny sometimes to see the difference in, uh, or, or the similarities, I guess, in military operations versus how some of these games work. Absolutely, absolutely. If, you know, you, uh, every snake needs a head, right? Mm -hmm. Like you, you need that brain to say, hey, this is what we're gonna be doing. So you think that, um, so Wagner did a lot of that light infantry movement, a lot mm -hmm. of smaller scale stuff. They had stuff. some tanks and armor sure. personal carriers, but yeah. Okay, so then, Training, training, training. Mm -hmm. uh, dig one level deeper. Do you think mm -hmm. Russia didn't train its troops because of arrogance, because of some people point to communist corruption where they thought they were better than they were. Yeah. Some people point to lack of money to, to replace the tires on their Jeeps or the treads of their tanks. Money. You think it's money? It is money, and there might be some corruption there. Like, hey, we gave you, look, the Russian army doesn't even have socks, all right? They use this thing called portyanki, which are these, think of them as handkerchiefs. You take this handkerchief and you put it down by your foot and you fold one side over the other side and then you lift the toe up 
and you wrap the rest around your ankle. And actually learning how to tie Port Yankee was like a rite of passage in Russia. You know, that they, like they still, that's what they, they use? still use this stuff. Now, in, in some ways, it's a feature, not a bug, because now you don't have to create three different sizes of socks. You just give them one Protect. handkerchief, right? And if they need to dry their Port Yankee out, they just put it on their shoulders. They can walk. It's just a piece of cloth that'll dry, you know, fairly quickly. Right. So in some ways, it's a very Soviet solution, right? Well, we don't have the technology to make socks. Socks are expensive. We don't want to carry three sizes because of logistics. Let's just give everybody cloths. Kind right? of cheap, quick, and fast. She, yeah, cheap, quick, and fast. And it works. It, it, I mean, mostly, right? I mean, if you don't tie your Port Yankee correctly, you get blisters and all that as well. Um, but so if you're some Russian officer and you've been given, I don't know, you've been given $1 million for this year to train your troops, you might say to yourself, you know what? Our troops really aren't going to be doing that much fighting. Uh, so let me put some toward this dacha. We'll have one exercise. It'll be pre-scripted. We'll give each guy 10 rounds. They'll go through the motions. And then, you know, everybody, no, nobody's none the wiser, right? Okay, I can understand. So here's what I'm trying to figure out. I understand what you're saying in terms of this might explain why they have the lack of capabilities. Mm -hmm. But what I'm really curious about is why didn't they understand that? So, for instance, if you might know, like, yeah. well, we don't train enough, we don't have the money for this, why would you act in a way that seems to, to betray yeah. that you didn't realize it? Like because the rolling tanks before. on the first day. Okay, gotcha. It worked in South Ossetia, in so Georgia. They, it was like an arrogance. Like, they thought it would be enough. It, it always worked before. Although, right? yeah, Georgia versus Ukraine, though, is... <laughs> well, it, when... So, uh, in Chechnya, in, was it 93, these guys, they rolled into Grozny, Jesus. They got schwacked, and they, they re consolidated, reorganized, and went, crap, what the hell happened to us? And they just rolled in, just destroyed every single freaking building. They knew how to do that, right? And they did it again in South Ossetia, in Georgia, back in 2008, I believe it was. And Abkhazia, I think, as well. Yeah, There's a second territory. Yeah. Yeah, hey, this is working, right? Why not keep doing it? So I think that's kind of the, it always worked before until one day it didn't. Do you think there's going to be like a military revolution in Russia as a result of Ukraine? Like how, like, I mean, everyone, again, I'm going to speak from a super yeah. lay person because you both know a lot more than even I do. But even as a lay person, I was pretty much told that Ukraine was doomed. They were going to be rolled over across yeah. the entire country in three days and yeah. it was going to be over. And here we are, yeah. um, you know, years later. And so, well, not years, but more than yeah, three years. days. Yeah. Years. yeah. Um, I think in an it, all-out war. It's not what anyone expected. It feels like Russia could defeat Ukraine in an all-out war, but there's an interesting dynamic where Ukraine is fighting for its life, and Russia's not really allowed to tell its population that it's actually fighting. <laughs> and that it seems like, and every person in Ukraine is like, we're on the eve of destruction or annihilation, and we have to fight for everything. Okay. And All Russia things. can't mobilize the the population would like to because it is playing this dual role of like we're doing a special military operation in ukraine so we're not going to mobilize all you guys because it's not that like big the of Nazi a deal language like we're freeing them from nazis and stuff well no not it's it's not so much that it's that i don't think that russia is not allowed to tell this population guys we've got to start drafting and go full-scale war because yeah. putin will lose all support so you can only conscript a small portion of the population you can't do a full-scale mobilization you have to pretend it's not a big deal while also understand that if you lose oof it looks really 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 bad yeah kind of, um so I can tell you this, uh, from what I understand, the Ukrainians, and I'm sure I'm, someone's going to write me and say, no, you're wrong. But from what I understand, what I've been told, uh, in Kiev, they still have Molotov cocktails. A Molotov cocktail is a, a liquor bottle or a beer bottle. You put gasoline, maybe a gel in there as well, and you put a wick in there. You light that wick on fire. You throw that at a tank. It'll crash against the tank. I played Daisy. Explode I know and fire, and fire, right? <laughs> so... So, I'll tell you this. A Molotov cocktail isn't going to do a damn thing to a tank. Right. Nothing. And you get people, what are you throwing in the engine compartment? Like, well, you're going to be so terrified. Good luck. Best of luck with that. Let me know how it works out. So, I mean, if you, if you do throw it inside a tank, it's going to ruin someone's day. It, it'll burn out, like, if you throw it on the outside. The people of Kiev do not want to be slaves to the point where they still have Molotov cocktails in milk crates at the bus station, at the bus bus benches, and with instructions up on the bus bench wall how to use them and where to throw them. Interesting. 
These are people who are never, they're going to fight to the last tooth and the last claw. Right. Yeah, they, they, they will not give in to Russia. So you would agree kind of with this analysis of basically like the Russian troops have this like very different morale and even mentality in the war, whereas for Ukraine, it's literally life or death. Yeah. And that's the major difference. That's in a big the problem. Success. What are you even fighting for on the Russian side? Like, what are you? For your buddies. When, I mean, like, why? Yeah. The, the I mean, you're fighting for your buddies, right? Or you're fighting for your paycheck. And also a lot of guys in Russia, like they, when they get that draft notice, they go like, you know, it's my duty. I gotta go do my duty, just like just like uh, my grandfather did during the Great Patriotic War. I gotta do my duty. I feel like the feeling there is like if if I, if maybe I speak for myself. I don't think so. If we went to war formally with mm -hmm. Syria and the U.S. tried to do a draft, I think a lot of people would not be okay with that. I don't want to go to the Middle East to fight another war mm -hmm. after Iraq. We're traumatized from that. This is bullshit. Mm -hmm. I think that if Russia or China somehow made it across the Pacific, was landing on the shores of California and Washington, I think almost, I think 80% of the population would have a rifle and they'd be ready to go and fight. I think that the motivation to protect your country against a foreign invader versus doing whatever the hell you think is happening as a Russian in another country, I think the motivations to fight, it's not so much, a, a little bit it impacts the individual soldier, I imagine, yeah. but it's not so much that, so much as politically what can your population endure? Because it seems like, I remember that there were hilarious articles coming out, RT approved articles, where it's like Zelensky losing support for the war and his support drops from like 89% to like 87.5%. Yeah. Ukrainians still really want to fight. Whereas Russia has to live in this double world where they, ha they have to be so careful because if it looks like he genuinely needs to mobilize more of the population to go and fight, there's going to be like large scale revolt. People just aren't going to be hyped to go and fight a war in Ukraine that's now dragged on for almost two years. So it's, I think it's the political implications even more so than just the individual soldier motivations to fight. Although I'm sure that impacts that a little bit too. Mm -hmm. The um, something, uh, I, there's, there's two parts on this that I wanna talk about I'm so interested mm -hmm. in. One has to do with, one has to do with war crimes and cameras. Mm -hmm. But before we do this, uh, on the macro level, people talk a lot about Ukraine and whether or not they can ever win mm -hmm. and the shift to positional versus maneuverable warfare and that it's grinded to a halt. Do you think that, two questions. One is, do you think that Ukraine has been allowed to fight as much as they'd want to? Mm -hmm. Have they been enabled by the West? And two, if they were enabled more by the West, do you think they would make more progress on the battlefield? They have not, they have fought like wolves with, with what they've had. The West slow walked a lot of equipment to them at the beginning and that was to their detriment. Um, you know, I could say like, hey, if we had given them this amount of equipment, this amount of whatever, uh, things would be different. But while we're dreaming, I want a pony. I can't go back and I can't change that stuff, right? We, we deal, we have the army, like, like Donald Rumsfeld said, we go to war with the army we have, not the army we want, mm -hmm. or we wish we had, right? Um, and that was kind of number one. Number two, could they take back their land? I think they could. I don't see Ukraine winning in the sense of there is a ceremony on a battleship, uh, you know, in the in Moscow, right? I, I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. What I see is, I th I think it's certainly possible that if Ukraine can destroy the Kerch Strait Bridge, it makes Russia's position in Crimea untenable. That bridge is the thing connecting the east part of Crimea to the land and the to the land yep. you know, okay. to Russia proper. Yeah. So it's a bridge. And they that, could retake Crimea in your mind if they has, can get that. Bridge. They can t if they can take that bridge down then it's going to be a lot harder for Russia to, to move supplies. One of the things Ukraine is amazing at is what's called shaping operations, right? So you're trying to shape the battlefield. And they're really good at that. If they can take out, I think this year it will be the year they do it. They take okay. out the bridge. What does that look like? Sorry, I, yeah. I'm sorry to be so pedantic. No, but when no, you no. say like shaping operations, it mm -hmm. sounds really interesting. Like I think of like a couple of like the stories of like Ukrainians, like like the one Ukrainian man, like risking his life to blow out that important bridge mm -hmm. um, pretty early on, like almost, almost two years ago now. Mm -hmm. um, when you're talking about shaping operations, what does yeah. that actually mean? Like what is the middle age, what is Ukraine doing that's unique that makes them, as you say, kind of shape the battlefield okay. in the way that they want it? So a shaping operation uh, sets up the victory conditions for the future. So blowing up bridges, stuff like blowing that. Blowing up bridges, stuff like that. And instead of worrying about stuff on the tactical level, they've also had other teams blow up Russian oil refineries or try to destroy ships. Mm -hmm. And each one of these things is a pinprick that makes it harder for Russia to supply and to fight. Okay. 
So what I see is that I think Ukraine could cut off Crimea. And at that point, now we enter negotiations. Does Ukraine take back the Donbass and Crimea? I don't think so. You think it's more likely that they could take back Crimea versus the Donbass? Maybe. Because I feel like Russia would be more incentivized because of Sevastopol and everything to protect Crimea and their entry to the Black Sea versus... I mean, they can want it all they want. When they have the, the, the lift to supply troops there uh, via, via the ocean, that's, that's another story, right? But I think if you can cut off Crimea and you can, you can draw a wedge between uh, the Donbass and Crimea, then what you have is an end to operations, and Ukraine is now negotiating from a position of strength instead of weakness. Do I see them capturing and killing every single Russian in the Donbass, Zaporizhia, and Crimea? No. But I think they could force Russia's hand, go to the negotiating cable from a position of strength. And what I see, honestly, is a peacekeeping force made up of uh, various, maybe non-aligned nations. Maybe you see like India and Bangladesh and Fiji and these nations, they create a peacekeeping force inside Crimea and the Donbass. But that might be some kind of A zone, B zone, C zone mm -hmm. of, you know, Ukraine is allowed to have a certain number of tanks here. Russia is allowed to have a certain number of tanks here. And the, the uh, peacekeepers enforce that. And Ukraine doesn't necessarily get their land back, but they get to open up trade And you routes. think you think they reasonably could do that in Crimea if we unlocked the, the armor? We're going to unlock the F-16 soon. That is, okay, that's true. And that, you know, with the F-16, what do you have? We that's have air dominance. Jet? It's a jet. Absolutely mm -hmm. correct. It's a jet. So the F-16 is a jet that America authorized, I think it was Belgium and uh, Denmark. And or, when you say unlocked, does that mean that they will just have access to the F-16? They'll have access. The and F they've got their pilot. I think they're training now on them, they're right? They're training now. Mm -hmm. And with the, with the F-16, you have the what's called the AMRAAM missile, the AM-120. And this is a long-range missile. Nothing Ukraine has now can, can go as far as that missile. Now, Russia has longer-range missiles, but... It's going to force Russia to pull back. They got to pull back even further, right? Just to also to mm -hmm. clarify this, because I didn't even realize this until like months ago. Um, I thought that when planes shot missiles, I thought that it was within a mile at most when they're shooting at each other. But when we say long-range missiles, yeah, I think like 10, 20, miles, 30. Oh, yeah. okay, 88 miles. Yeah, these are the planes they can shoot. So two planes are shooting at each other 80 miles away. Not yeah, necessarily never planes, see each but other. Air, to, uh, air to surface that you can fire mm -hmm. at targets okay. from. Yeah. Two planes, they, they might, uh, you'd have your AWACS, which is that airborne early warning control system. The balloons? Oh, uh, well, like, well, that's PTIDs. Oh, Close. Man. That's fine. <laughs> so all right, did you ever see the movie Independence Day? Okay. Well, there was an AWACS yeah. Independence Day. There's a little rotating radar dome on it. Okay, okay. Yeah, and so that. that plane might be flying, and it tells the fighters, okay, you got bad guys. They're 120 miles away. Uh, turn to uh, you know, climb to Angels 30. Turn to uh, 80, and you know, you'll be able to pick them up on your radar, and then these planes will be able to fire. Sometimes the planes won't even know that they're being targeted. Right. They'll, they'll know when they're illuminated. Right, but some I think some missiles like the Amram, you can actually fire, and then it's it's self-guiding radar turns on a little bit later. Do you think Ukraine has the necessary coordination to operate that plane in an active military theater? They will. They don't. They don't now. Okay. They I mean, I, like, they're, so they're doing deconfliction too. They're mm -hmm. doing deconfliction. Actually, they're actually pretty good at it because right now, with the way things are in Russia. They have a lot of ground controllers that are using ground radar to figure out where Russia is. Because right now, when when uh, Russia will fly these combat air patrols, and they'll fly them over their territory. And when they see a Ukrainian helicopter pop up, they'll vector fighters toward that. They'll start firing missiles. Well, the ground control the Ukrainians will see that, and they'll tell the helicopter, get down on the ground right now. And they'll get down. That's why they can't do medevac, right? I mean, Russia will just shoot them down. Right. Right. So, uh, yeah, I think they can. But with that F-16, you can establish your dominance. Mm -hmm. As you establish your dominance, the next thing you have are anti-radiation missiles. So these are missiles that go after the radar of the surface-to-air missile radar sets. That are shooting down like planes. And that are shooting down planes. The Harm anti-radiation missile. They, we, they were able to like cobble together kind of like a, a little uh, trailer park, Amor, uh, trailer park um, uh, harm launcher on, on some of their jets, on their, uh, their uh, MiG-29s. They're able to, to fire those things. And now you have integrated sensors on the F-16 that can do, uh, as soon as they see that radar illuminate, they can find it and shoot it. 
right okay. now I think they have to go after pre-planned targets. They have to pro the load load the software beforehand. Mm -hmm. But now with the F-16, the integrated operation system, you can say, oh, that thing just popped up, fire a missile at that radar. So now what do the Russians have to do? They have to pull back further. So now there's surface air missile batteries to pull back further. Now people at the front are exposed. Now we get into the JDAM, the Joint Direct Attack Munition. That's another acronym. <laughs> All right, so now you got the JDAM. And the JDAM and the JDAM ER, they are these, uh, ER means extended range. So they like a little bomb that you drop and fins pop out and it glides to its target, right? So now they can use these JDAMs against Russian positions on the front line, and they can do it free from surface-to-air missile fire, free from harassing fire from Russian fighters. Because of the ra radio emission, whatever. Yeah, are. well, they fire the anti-radiation missiles at radiation, the same launchers. Yeah. They pulled them back, and now they have all right. Now they have battle space dominance in the air. To go so, back to the video game thing I said yesterday, that if you have one hole in your defense, if there mm -hmm. is a hole that slowly starts to open up every other part of the battlefield and you lose everything, essentially. Now you got those JDAMs coming it's down. the difference of the parity between offensive and defensive. Uh -huh. the, the Russia obviously knows this is coming. The F-16 yeah. is no secret. I think they're supposed to have those systems online, I think, the second half of this year. Yeah, I think we're coming. Be. So should what be. is Russia's counterplay to this? Certainly they're not just going to pull back and watch everything fall apart. There has to be some... They're probably going to surge as many aircraft in the air as possible and try to get a political victory. Look, it's not that hard to shoot down a... Uh, F-16. F-16. But here's here's the disadvantage. How long have they been flying those jets? About two years now. They've been riding them hard, right? Oh, the Russian side jets. Y you they You're talking about like pilot attrition or? No, well, pilot attrition, but maintenance. Oh. Oh, okay. So how long have they they've been riding those jets hard? Or right? the F-16s? So how many maintenance now? cycles have they missed? When we talk about um, we talk about numbers of aircraft, is it has it been stated? It must be. How many F-16s are the Ukrainians getting? I think it's 48. 48. What 48, is the size 44. of like Russia's air force for like planes that can shoot big. down F-16s? <laughs> like in the <laughs> very big. Like tons of hundreds or? Um, I want to say three to five hundred, but they're they're not all operational at the same time. Okay. So Do you, you might have a, a sortie rate. Like you, you might be able to generate fifty percent. Okay. So why would the maintenance be missed if they have such a massive field of airplanes? So it goes back to that cost thing. Yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. just money. They just can't afford I mean, to maintain it's them. It's money. Look, when you, uh, I've always said the F sixteen. When you fly the F sixteen, it's eight hours of maintenance for every one hour of flight. Now that doesn't mean you fly it for one hour, you got to put it down, you work an eight hours of maintenance. Like it's it's cumulative. Right. right. But there are certain cycles that you have to hit where you're like, hey. Um, all right, we, we hit our 40-hour maintenance cycle. We have to do the joke program. We have to take out the oil. We have to replace this thing or that thing or whatever. Uh, and different maintenance cycles take different amounts of time. So Russia's been flying these jets for a certain number of hours, and I'm sure a lot of them are in, especially their Su-34s, which are their bombers. Um, a lot of them are in... Uh, a maintenance cycle where like they, they could be coming up on their like uh, they call it d level maintenance which is like your your depot level you know you got to bring the plane it's back to the just depot bring deep cleaning of yeah the they got to deep clean it right they got to change all this stuff they got to inspect they got to x-ray all the wings to see if there's any cracks in them so they've been doing that for you know two years flying these things and then the ukrainians are getting fresh jets they're not they're not new they're not showroom new they're it's like getting a used car from hertz Right. right, you know, you bought the used car after it sells it after a year, right? So they're getting these older jets, but at least they're fresh and they they're they're refurbished, factory refurbished. Right. So the Ukrainians have a temporary advantage against Russia just because their jets don't need to get into that deep cycle maintenance that the Russians are already in. Okay, going back to your question, do you remember we were about to ask him? Um, no, it was, it was basically on that. I also wonder, do you think that for the training uh, for the F-16 system, mm -hmm. do you think they're going to be able to participate in like air-to-air -air stuff or is it just going to be those f-60s are going to be protected exclusively by things on the ground and then these planes are going to be grounded if russia tries to shoot them down that's a good question i think that they might get into air-to-air -air stuff because they'll be able to push out and i also wonder um how the russians will deal with them because as far as i know we've other than iraq in the in operation uh, Operation Desert Storm. Mm -hmm. I'm really trying to think of a situation where Russian MiGs tangled with F-16s. And I'm sure there's people who are watching the stream right now going, "What about Chile?" Or, yeah, so you know, I, I, I'm uh -huh. really trying to think. But I think during the first Gulf War, that was really the first time we tried to engage in any 
air to air combat with with Russian MiGs. Yeah. Although I'm tr trying to think of even like shooting down a yeah. U.S. F-16 yeah. that's participating in like combined arms mm -hmm. warfare with the whole U.S. military it might be significantly harder than shooting down an F-16 from a Ukrainian military that doesn't have the same type of. So that that could be it could mm -hmm. be easier to shoot down that Ukrainian plane because maybe they're not doing those multi-domain operations, mm -hmm. right? They don't necessarily have everything. Uh, but uh, if you're talking about pilot to pilot, you know one of the one of the things that's kind of on the Russian side is that it's unknown. Like what what are we dealing with here? We've never no one's ever actually fought an F-16, right? Mm. No, no Russian pilot ever has, right? So how do we how do we deal with this threat? Did Iraq even have an air force? Yeah, they yeah, did. We okay. destroyed it. Okay, <laughs> all right. You know, but it, for a couple of days they gave it the old <laughs> college try, and they actually sent quite a few planes to Iran, which Iran kept. Okay, you know. Gotcha. Hmm. Interesting. Do you have uh, another question? Because I, I might so derail us a little bit. Oh, well, okay. Yeah, because um, I, I have a direction mm -hmm. that I mm -hmm. would like to go, but I'm holding off because I want to make sure you get all your questions in. Sure. Okay, a couple of things. Um, <clears throat> stuff in the water can mm -hmm. impact stuff on land. Submarines, boats mm -hmm. can shoot missiles and land and everything. Mm -hmm. We've seen a lot of stories of Russia losing surprising assets in, in the air and in the sea to mm -hmm. Ukraine that to my knowledge, doesn't have a Navy. Yes. Um, how normal is that in any type of military operation that you're losing? Uh, do you think Russia has lost a significant amount of naval assets? Do you think it's surprising that Ukraine has been able to destroy them? Is that pretty ordinary for war that people are losing high-value naval assets? To, you, yeah. you know, that's a, that's a tough question. I try to, I tend to avoid naval stuff because again, Department of the Boat people. Like, I can talk a little bit about this stuff. Um, I can tell you that as far as I know, we really haven't had any significant naval actions since I want to say the Falklands War in 1982. Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying to think of like an example where we went Navy to Navy or anybody went Navy to Navy with each other. And it, it might have been the tanker war. You can say the tanker war in uh, the late 80s, which was Iran and the US and other allied nations who, were, who reflied Kuwaiti tankers and escorted them you know, through the, uh, through the Arabian Sea and the Straits of Hormuz. Um, I don't think we've ever seen anything like this before. Okay. Um, but Ukraine, like, they're so good at figuring out how to use existing technology, like these un unmanned surface vehicles, turning an unmanned surface vehicle, essentially, to turn a jet ski into a bomb. Mm-hmm. Uh -huh. Like, nobody's ever thought of that. But these guys, well, which is nobody ever had to. I mean, I've seen the Houthis have done it in Yemen, where they take some of these boats that they got from the old, mm -hmm. might have been British assets, or maybe just uh, from the South Yemen mm -hmm. government. But yeah, you load up basically this boat with a bunch of bombs, and it's just like a, um, uh, just a small little jet boat Isn't or whatever. Isn't like the, you... the Russian truck where they just like load it full of missiles, the, like Korshnikov or oh, yeah, the uh, or something yeah, like that? Yeah, I can't the Grad Rockets and yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Stalin's it... Organ. Sounds very similar to that. Yeah. Um, okay, one more question then on macro war. I've got mm -hmm. some war crime uh, mm -hmm. camera related stuff, but you can do your thing first. But real quick, do you think that if Ukraine, if we enable them fully to participate in the war, yeah. do you think, this might be more of a political question than a strategic question, do you think it would be good or wise to enable them to strike into Russia when it comes to hitting oil refineries, transportation lines, logistics, stuff like that? Or do you think that should probably be avoided? I think they should be able to strike where they want to strike. Okay. And I know that that could mean American, you know, what Russia's going to do is they're going to take a look at American missiles and they have Lockheed Martin stamped on them with a, with a lot number. Uh -huh. And they're going to be hopping mad. But I don't see them going to war with us because they got their hands full right now. So, like, you probably stupid games, you win stupid prizes. One of those prizes might be a Tomahawk missile. I think I largely agree. I don't think I would have a year ago, but I think I agree now. Yeah, what, what are they going to do? Escalate more? <clears throat> right. Yeah, that's yeah. always my they, issue. They, is they, they can escalate all by them damn self. You know, mm -hmm. What was that Tyler Perry movie? I can do bad all by myself. Right. We don't need to give them an excuse. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? I know you, you were wanting to ask something. What was that? Um, well, it's a bit of a derail. So is there oh. anything else that you have kind of in this direction? Um, if you want to finish on Ukraine, Russia, here's just some uh, just some random questions about cameras. Mm -hmm. um, I think it might have been the first Iraq wars when we first started to get not the first, I'm sure, it's the second Gulf War, second 2001, Gulf. I think, is when we first started to get camera footage. Mm -hmm. um, I remember there was that one video of the sniper shot dinging off the guy's helmet as he came back, okay. and you saw the uh, yeah. Do you think that when we talk about like um, like shooting soldiers that mm -hmm. have surrendered, or you talk about I don't want to just say like committing war crimes, but doing things you probably shouldn't do. There have been a lot of uh, things that have come out on camera where people are like, 
hmm, hold on, what's going on here? My assumption would be that uh, for as much as we shouldn't, there's probably been historically a lot of this kind of stuff that has happened during military conflict just because of sheer numbers involved. Mm -hmm. Do you think that having cameras on soldiers and seeing things captured on camera or like the confusion about can you surrender to a drone, for mm -hmm. instance, where if you've got a soldier surrendering to a soldier, that's clearly in violation. Yeah. But if a guy surrendering to a drone, can you do that? Do you think that this is going to change people's understandings of, of how military conflict is supposed to be conducted or what's right or what's wrong? Or is it just like more noise? Or? People are just going to get more confused. Oh, okay. Because I, I probably get I, – I, I get literally hundreds of emails a day. I would say I get about 100 emails a day. Mm -hmm. And uh, people send me probably about 20 emails a day with questions. And like, I, I, can't, I can't answer it. And I can't, I, I get that a lot too. How come you haven't covered this? You're a Zionist shill. Like I got, I got 24 hours in a day and I'm already working 13 to 16 of them. Mm -hmm. I'll get to it, maybe. <laughs> You know, like I got, there's a reason why I haven't covered this. And actually, you know, it, when, when I do a video on YouTube, um, you know, if if YouTube is going to demonetize this, I really got to think about it before I put this video out because, like, at the end of the day, this is my job and I need to pay my mortgage, mm -hmm. right? So I wish I was a Zionist shill. I'll be more than happy to work for the CIA. Please write me a check. You hear that, CIA? Write me a check. I will do whatever you want. But since you haven't, I'm just going to keep on being me. So uh, when it comes to when it comes to people looking at footage uh, from soldiers, you know, GoPro footage or cell phone footage, that to me, that is absolutely terrifying in a way, because I think that 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 a lot of people get their touchstone of military knowledge from playing Call of Duty. Right. And nobody ever surrenders in Call of Duty. Nobody ever is crying for their mother or they're wounded um their 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 uh their stomach's been been cut open and their intestines have fallen out and you know mm -hmm. um uh th there's there's things that like you, you don't <laughs> that, that you don't really see in call of duty that that you do in real life and I think most people, since they don't really know what the LOAC is, the Law of Armed Conflict, there's another acronym, they don't know what the LOAC is, they don't really know about the Geneva Convention, or they think they know the Geneva Convention, and it looks like this is a war crime violation, so I'm going to post on Twitter, this is a violation of the Geneva Convention. Did you read the freaking Geneva Convention? You know, it, it is perfectly legal to kill an unarmed soldier. Absolutely. There's only two types of soldiers that you're not allowed to shoot. Chaplains medical personnel medical personnel should be clearly marked as well all right There's two types of soldiers if they're not armed you know look if you shoot a missile at a tactical operations center a command post how many people in there are armed they're armed with a ham sandwich and a cup of coffee right mm -hmm. that's what they're doing in their command center so it's probably illegal to kill them so a lot of people they, they just don't know what they're looking at and unfortunately that can that can influence the public perception of war but we have kids who've grown up with smartphones for at least 10 years right mm -hmm. iphone's almost 20 years old yeah. yeah you know now it's a second limb right we need to one of the things we need to figure out is actually in the geneva convention it says that uh, you're not allowed to put soldiers on display like public display it can't be a public curiosity all right once you capture a prisoner well is taking a cell phone video of them a public curiosity hmm. i don't know i don't have an answer for that I, what if you post on TikTok? Well, like, so one of the things I've seen Israelis do is they, they had these these captured prisoners who were, like, half naked and their you know, hoods over their head and they're making them say, you know, uh, stuff about, like, oh, I can't wait to be a gardener for the Israeli. You know, like, dude, don't freaking do that. Number one, it's humiliating. Number two, it's against the, it's against the Geneva Convention. Number three, like, one day you're going to have to go home and look at yourself in the mirror. And people wonder why I'm still single at 50. All right? So don't do stuff that you're going to regret years from now. It's going gonna, it's gonna to make you turn toward this more than, more than your friends and your family. And you've got right? the uniform on. You are a representative of your country. And when you do bad stuff like that, people don't see an IDF soldier or a Russian soldier or Ukrainian soldier is doing something bad. They, it reflects on the entirety of the military that you're a part of. Yeah.
Yeah. So it's I think it's kind of dangerous. But I don't know how we fix that because the soldiers are always going to sneak that cell phone in. And that actually scares the hell out of me because one of the things I think of is ELINT, another acronym, Electronic Warfare. Like some dude's got their cell phone pinging. Like, well, now I can freaking, okay, there's five IDF soldiers coming up over here. I'm going to st- uh, drop an artillery around right here. Yeah. Um, Please. It actually segues really well into what yeah. I was going to ask about because I feel like one of my biggest concerns in so I do my I try to not talk actually too much about foreign politics because I don't mm-hmm. know much about it um, which is why I would prefer to ask questions and if I say no. anything I'm not an expert so don't listen to me um, but another thing that I know that I don't know enough about is like violence and warfare mm-hmm. and like what that actually looks like um, I've like made up this word to call it because I don't know if there's a theory so if somebody in chat like knows a theory of this let me know but I call it the theory of violence which is basically our own understanding it's like a mental schema that we have of what violence is when it's justified to do it what it looks like Mm -hmm. how it feels to do it and like when it should and should not be done and this applies to both ourselves and others and i feel like most people including myself have an exceedingly immature theory of violence right like most citizens would probably say violence bad people who do violence bad except maybe self-defense and that would be like the nuanced level of understanding of violence And then I see people trying to commentate on violence at a micro scale, like watching teens having fights or Mm -hmm. clocking each other and stuff and watching the response there. I'm like, I don't, I don't actually understand. I've never been in a fist fight. I've no, I've never been trained in martial arts. I have no idea. And then we move this to even like a large scale understanding. It feels like we have this, like, especially citizens in North America that are so sheltered from violence. Like most people think violence will never occur to them. Um, when it could happen to anyone at any time. Um, how much do you think that, like, A, citizens don't understand about what it means to be in, like, war, what it means to be, like, a soldier? But also beyond that, um, how does that influence the way that specifically this kind of, like, this social media representation and the conversations that we have about it um, and the basically, like, the PR of military tactics and whatnot? Boy, that, that's a, that's a pretty you know you're, you're gonna find out pretty quickly that I'm not a very deep thinker. <laughs> <laughs> like I like I like whiskey. I like cigars. A, that 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 is a, a pretty big. You know what what's funny is that people like you. You know I, I grew up a, a poor kid and uh, you know I, I never thought I was gonna amount to anything. And I, uh, I, I I no matter how many degrees I get, I, I you just kind of took me back to that that kid who was supposed to be a carpenter. <laughs> you know, because like I don't, I guess my brain doesn't work on that level. So I think one of the the questions you asked was that uh, you know since most people they don't understand violence, you know how can they relate to what, sure. what soldiers are going through? Or well, like maybe narrow it down. What do we not know? Like what are what are citizens missing when they're watching soldiers talk about these things? And I agree, there are soldiers that do things that absolutely the, they're going to regret. What's the scariest thing that's ever happened to you? I'm probably not the best scale to use because i've had a pretty wild life um scariest when did you know in my car when i was driving (laughs) true so the first time i knew that i was gonna die yeah like the first freaking time i was so scared and i had to actually um i had to load a a machine gun and um so it was a task i had done thousands of times and my hands were shaking so much I couldn't actually get the feed tray cover open to yeah. put the rounds in. That's how terrified I was. And the, the 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 only way I can describe like that's one thing like a lot of people don't understand. It, it, probably about the closest you can get to it is a car accident. You ever in a car accident and then you have that adrenaline, yeah, you know, and you're shaking a little bit, and the police are there and you're shaking, or maybe you've been pulled over by the cops and you know what's going to happen to you and you're shaking. Like, I think a lot of people, they don't understand the absolute terror. And you know, like, like, and sometimes then it's okay. Like, then, then you kind of get into the, the like, oh, I got to drive down Rhode Irish again. You know, I don't know if the side of the road is going to blow up, but it just becomes kind of normal right. after a certain amount of time. Right. And I'm not even embarrassed about that, about being so, uh, that, uh, that one time when I thought I was going to die, like, oh, God, this is it. 
Yeah, you it's know? very different, uh, right? Because I've been in car be crashes. Done. I've been in like situations where like a boat mm-hmm. almost capsized, but let's it's like acute and immediate. Like the only thing that I can even begin to ground similarly is when like I had a client with schizophrenia who was being restrained because he was trying to like claw out his eyes. Um, sorry for all the you details. have a boat. <laughs> no, I don't have a boat. I was on it a was boat. It was the girl on the boat. Who had, the girl how does everybody boat? have a boat but me? I was you Miami. Have a boat? It's Miami Beach. Oh. Um, but I remember like walking up because he like for some reason I was one of the only people that could help him like yeah. he also had PTSD like come out mm-hmm. um, but it was really intimidating because he was very violent when he was having like an episode mm-hmm. um, but I can't imagine like my life wasn't under threat in that situation it was still really intimidating yeah. obviously to be walking up to this like large kid who's screaming and like trying to do violence I've never been in a situation where like it's not just an acute like oops an accident happened and then afterwards you look back and you're like oh my gosh I literally could have died yeah. in that situation you're like walking into a situation saying Oh my gosh, I could almost die. Um, which I feel like yeah, knowing people don't is, understand. That kind of sucks. Yeah. Like knowing, oh <laughs> crap, this guy's going into a rage and I got to go in there until security arrives or whatever. I got to put him down. And you're what? Five, you know. Seven. Hundred and, yeah, five, seven, 110 pounds wet, right? Not like, quite yeah. a little heavier, but yeah. <laughs> you know, like, yeah, I can imagine that's pretty terrifying. Right. I think this crazy thing is how dramatic the descriptions sound the first time somebody experiences that and then how very like coldly it becomes normalized when they experience it. I've got a lot right. of friends in um, Ukraine and then a few in Israel that talk to me about like the first time, especially people in Ukraine, where you're getting missiles that are hitting houses on your block and you're seeing things blow up and it's the scariest thing and then you've got i'm sure you've seen the ukrainian and a girl mm-hmm. comes in a stream sometimes and talks and it's just like another day it's 3 a.m in my hallway and there's like explosions in my city and that's just an unbelievable it's hard being in america to imagine that like that happens and then the next day you go to work yeah and that's just like that's, unbelievable to me yeah. yeah that is i knew there was a second question you asked along that and i actually can't remember what that was i guess the tie-in is basically how because when people look at like the idf for example mm-hmm. or not to transition too much to israel and gaza unless yeah. you want to go there next but that's the next part okay perfect when people look at like israel and gaza the biggest question i've had in all this that i'm not really comfortable answering with my like limited expertise is what is reasonable to expect from the soldiers on the ground um, what are they experiencing? I have no idea. Mm-hmm. But also, like, is there indiscriminate uses of weaponry or is there not? What is, like, the Hamas fighters? What are the civilians of Palestine experiencing? What's the dynamic between, obviously, this more guerrilla warfare that the Hamas has mm-hmm. uh, versus, like, the IDF, which is a much more organized state nation? Um, I, I can't even begin to understand any of these pieces, which yeah. is why I'm very uncomfortable making too much commentary on, like, the rightness or the wrongness of... Um, specifically the military tactics yeah. and I don't know like what even the as a citizen what are even the beginning steps of how I figure out how to answer that question boy that's a tough one I, I can tell you I don't know I can tell you that the the average idea of soldier if they've been there for a while is is they're they're probably uh, they're probably exhausted and if they're um, if they're a reservist uh, depending on the job that they have they're probably really sucking right now because they're making uh, between 800 and I think 20, 1200 shekels a month. Like, you know, they're, they're, they're supposed to get a differential with their civilian pay, but of course, if you're a forklift driver, you're going to get less differential than if you're a software engineer, right? right. Um, I, I would imagine a lot of them are like either giddy to, for the end game, like let's just freaking get this over with, with the, t- tempered by the fear that nobody wants to be the last casualty in in Gaza. No no soldier wants, you know, it's, because now you're kind of at the point where it's like, I mean, I survived this long, and I, I might buy it on this next final push into Rafa. And, you know, I'm so close to the end. So I'd imagine there's some dudes, and, and when you kind of get into that mindset, now it's like, now you're going to not only be, I don't say making mistakes, but now a lot more civilians could die. Because you're probably going to be a little less surgical, right? You know, um, you're going to be a little less surgical because it's like I'm com- I'm going home. So I'm you're going just home. there's like less trigger discipline. There's just like less cautionary. There response. there there might be more cautionary stuff. And by cautionary, I mean I think there's a sniper in that building. You know what? Okay. We we got maybe we're going to be here another two weeks. Let's just freaking take down the building. Hey, we got permission to take down the building. Light it up. Okay. Now the average Hamas fighter. I don't know. There's there's different kinds of, of fighters, but 
I would say the average anti-Israel fighters, not all of them are Hamas, there's like 10 different organizations in, uh, in Gaza. Sometimes they fight with each other, sometimes they, they fight the Israelis. Um, so some of them might be thinking like, oh, we didn't, we didn't expect that. Like, you know, we thought this was going to be, you know, this is going to be a, a six-week cast lead kind of thing. And, uh, oh, man, now my family's in a lot of trouble, you know, or maybe I've been wounded. I'm not getting the attention I need. I think they're, they're suffering. They might be suffering a little bit of regret. But if, if you truly believe that there is no God but God and Muhammad is his messenger, um, then you'll be in heaven soon, right? right. And that, that's something to be happy about. Um, the average civilian... Is <laughs> I can't even imagine because I mean, it's like you take everything bad about Sarajevo and make it smaller, you know. What's Sarajevo? So, I'm sorry. So in in uh, 19 uh, 1992 there was uh, Yugoslavia kind of dissolved into civil war, yeah. and Sarajevo was one town that the Serbian side was shelling, and just every single day. Bosnian Serbs had to deal with being shelled in Sarajevo. I don't know if you ever, you two are gamers. Have you heard of a game called This War is Mine? Heard of it, but I haven't played it. No, this game, This War is Mine, was actually, uh, I'm not sure if he was Serbian or he was Bosnian, but this guy who survived the Battle of Sarajevo, he developed this game. And actually, from what I understand, this game is taught. It's the first computer game that's ever been taught in schools. Like, go play as a civilian just trying to survive in a war zone. Uh, average civilian, uh, the average civilian has seen their, uh, their uh, grandfather die from, because uh, he had diabetes and he had no insulin after a certain amount of days. Uh, the average uh, civilian there uh, has seen people pulled from rubble because, like, Israel's going like, well, you know, we got daddy L baddies in this building. What do we got? We got a 1,000-pounder on an F-35. What else we got in the area? We got nothing? All right, I'll use a thousand pounder. All right? Mm. They've seen that. They've seen their mother who has cancer, hasn't gotten the chemotherapy in five months. And I'm sure there's Israelis who are listening to this going like, who cares? <laughs> tough. Don't 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 start something you can't finish. Right? And it is tough. But you know, that's it's the the sit the the reality of the situation on the ground for the average civilian is not good. And you know, they're, they, they're caught between a rock and a hard place. I mean, the, there might be some situations where, and this is horrible to say, but Hamas does not want these people to get aid. Hamas doesn't give a crap about these guys. The, Hamas wants to control Gaza and the West Bank. Mahmoud Abbas is 88 years old. He's, two, he's got more years in back of him than he has in front of him. At 88, there's not a lot, there's not a lot left on the actuarial tables, right? So he dies. And I think the plan was that, like, look, we're going to raid Israel, we're going to grab a couple of hostages, and then when uh, Mahmoud Abbas dies, we take over the West Bank by saying to Israel, install us as leadership on the West Bank, we give back the hostages. I don't think they counted on what happened next, which is a freaking sledgehammer to the face. Right. How not, though? I feel like that was, like, obvious. Well, 2008, 2014, the operations were a lot more limited in scope, and it wasn't yeah it wasn't this maybe Hamas was more as dark as it is to say more successful than they thought they'd be like perhaps if they'd killed one to two hundred people and captured two hundred hostages maybe it would look different but the numbers were way too big and the the video footage changes a lot too because now it's not just numbers now you've got video footage of bodies and you've got Mm -hmm. video footage of people being killed um I hope your stream remains monetized (laughs) <laughs> yeah, it, yeah, we're good. We're and then the I, um, I think I'm on some kind of YouTube list. Yeah. yeah I'm in go. YouTube jail right now, doing all day. Me and Preston Stork doing all day in YouTube jail. Mm-hmm. Um the, my question the, these get like a lot of a lot of armed conflict stuff, mm-hmm. especially in regards to asymmetrical warfare, mm-hmm. especially in regards to non state actors, mm-hmm. gets very political very quickly. What are your it's a very broad question, but yeah. what are your opinions about state actors or state responsibility when you're operating against non-state actors that might be administering to territory or administrators in a territory that also engage in 
asymmetrical warfare involving the utilization of civilians. This has been a huge criticism for Israel that, you know, they don't do enough warning, they mm -hmm. don't do enough distinction, they don't do enough um, proportionality. What? Yeah, my question is broad. I could be more specific if you want. No, I, yeah. I know exactly what you're saying. It sucks to be a war is hard. Yeah. You know, you, um, as, as the state actor taking on the non-state actor, you still have to abide by the Geneva Convention. Of course. Even if your adversary is. Mm -hmm. And if that makes it harder, or that means you have more casualties because you're trying to do the right thing, even though the adversary is not doing the right thing, you got to do it anyway. And I think sometimes what we see in Israel is that they make a calculation of saying, like, you know what? Dead Palestinian mother is not going to vote, but an Israeli mother as a dead son will. And that's that, that's a horrible calculation, right? But it's kind of the truth. That, you know what? If it's easier to blow up this building, why risk, why risk losing 10 soldiers taking this building? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's going to suck, but... You know what? The, and, I, and in some ways, I actually kind of blame the international community because 10 days after the, uh, it was on uh, October 17th, 10 days after October 7th, is where Israel lost the information war. Oh, uh, with that hospital. The hospital. Yeah. And now they're kind of like, you know what? You don't want to be on our side. We won't be on your side, my friend. Right. Like, screw you, <laughs> you guys. Know? Screw you guys. We're going to do it our way. Yeah. And... You know, we're taking we're taking the the casualties anyway, so we're just going to do it our way. That hospital situation is such mm -hmm. a good example, though, of like everyone's like lack of information. I think I remember like Hassan. I don't know if you know who Hassan is. He's it's a, like a communist or something, right? Yeah, he's like a streamer communist. Okay. He's a good friend of the stream, but um, he was talking a bunch about the hospital bombing um, and being really declarative about like the nature of the missile, yeah. what had actually occurred, and obviously like. What, what does he know about any of this stuff? Um, he's not former military? No. He's not former intelligence. So. He's he? not even intelligent. <laughs> <laughs> then I, I, don't, I don't think that really qualifies him to answer those kinds of questions. Right. It's, it's always good to have an opinion, but uh, I wouldn't take that as... What? I wouldn't take that as... Yeah. Uh, I think I mean, the, very, the, the frustrating thing about asymmetrical warfare is it's designed to induce a certain type of international pushback and it's frustrating how effective it is I think that um, yeah that essentially you know you can ask like has Israel taken steps to protect the enemy the the I don't know the the, the enemy civilian population it feels I don't want to call civilians enemies but have they adversary. taken the part, adversary yeah. yeah have they taken steps to reduce casualties on the other end and I think regardless of whether you think they've taken enough or haven't taken enough they clearly have yeah, more have. than any other military yeah. in the They're history of the planet. They're not lining people yeah. up and, and shooting them in the back of them. <clears throat> but Hamas has taken zero steps if I'm being charitable because if you're being uncharitable they've kept people from moving different areas they've operated out of yeah. civilian areas even as humanitarian convoys are moving through areas and it's frustrating to see how effective that style of engagement is because almost all of the international condemnation squarely falls on Israel and I've never seen you know like uh, oh why doesn't Hamas build a tunnel for their own population or why doesn't Hamas do anything to move civilians or why haven't they built any bomb shelters or why haven't they facilitated humanitarian like there's no responsibility on their side well they're the bad guys yeah, like I that, know. That's kind of, you know, you need to have the bad guys to fight against, right? And well, who, wait, I've Israel or Hamas is the bad guy? Uh, no, Hamas is the bad guy. I, sure. I am more pro-Palestinian than Hamas. Sure. Well, I think <laughs> anybody is. You know, yeah, yeah, like, yeah, no, I, no. I, I, I mean, I was a guy, and people didn't like it. Israelis, you know, messaged me when I, when I talked about the plan for the Sons of Palestine, where we arm Palestinians who can pass biometric security checks. We arm those guys and tell them, go after Hamas. You're going to form the core of a new government when all this is over with. Here's some guns. Here's some training. Go after Hamas. Go yeah. get them. And I, oh, Ryan Havel Shali, you don't understand. It doesn't work like that. Well, why don't you freaking try it? Because what you're doing now do not seem to be working neither. Right. Right? I mean, that's just me. I, I modeled that off for the Sons of Iraq, where essentially this, when we were in Iraq, you, the Iraqis, the Sunnis, uh, decided to kind of back out of the elections and a lot of the peaceful the peace process a lot of them didn't want to join the police so the sunnis kind of took over a lot of police and government functions and this the we essentially started paying uh sunni muslims to not to kill us here's 300 dollars a month here's a rifle here's a week of training 
go guard this checkpoint. And I've often said, nothing stops a bullet like a job. Hmm. Nothing stops a bullet like a job. So now these dudes, I can provide for my family. I'm somebody. And now we saw we saw the the Sunni sons of Iraq give way to Shia sons of Iraq, give way to mixed unit Sunni and Shia sons of Iraq. This is what we want. And now you look at Baghdad, they got the cafes opening. I mean, as of 2010, the cafes are open again. People are walking around. I, there was this one dude, this Iraqi marshal, who, who <clears throat> said to me, Ryan, I hope one day you can come back to my country on vacation. I said, Jamie, I hope so too. Like that, you know, I, I of course, I, I'm a big fan of the Iraqi people and, and their their level of devotion to taking back their country. You know, that's so that's kind of my, my eyes might be rose colored glasses because I saw what the Iraqis were capable of. Uh-huh. You know, and you, know, you can say, oh, the Palestinians are different. And in some ways, they are. There are people who have a key, and this key is a personal totem that they keep in a box, and like on the, the wall. This is the key to the house that we had when the Jews forced us to leave. And they've carried that key with them for 70 years, 75 years, mm-hmm. right? And these guys, you know, they... Um, it, it's tough kind of getting past that mindset. One day I'm going to get this key back. Like, where are we right now? Florida, right? What was in Florida 200 years ago? Seminoles. I don't see any Seminoles around here. And I'm sure you feel just horrible about what Andrew Jackson did to those Seminoles. But it is kind of nice it doesn't snow, right? I don't know where you're going with this, but okay. (laughs) Well, are we ever going to give Florida back to the Seminoles? Probably not. It's not going to happen. Sure. Palestinians are not getting their homes back. They're not. The ones that, that Israel took from them and the ones that the Arabs evicted them from. Like, oh, no, no, get off this land. We'll, we'll, t- we'll let you come back when we've destroyed the Jews. Right. Well, that didn't work out so well, right? So they're not getting that land back, but we can turn Gaza into a paradise. We really can. It just takes a couple of dudes who want to change, and they have guns. And they go after that death cult that has strangled their nation for the past 15 years. You mean like Hamas? Yes. Mm-hmm. Yes. That's the death cult. Yeah. It's just this optic thing is so frustrating me when I listen to, um, because I feel like, especially when you're the IDF, it's basically, because we have such a bad idea of like violence, you see like the big strong guy hitting like the weak small guy and small with like the O. Um, and so we go like, that's really bad. And it's like, is it though? Um, like, is this actually bad? And this is like the question that I think, I, I'm, I feel like I'm smart enough to go, is it though? I don't actually know. Probably not. October 7th was horrible and not okay and there has to be a long-term solution that can't just be like i guess we'll just keep dropping like several hundreds of thousands of dollars to block rockets from coming into israel indefinitely for the rest of our lives like that's not the answer and then invade every 10 years israelis Mm -hmm. call it mowing the grass yeah exactly but it's like that doesn't feel i don't know that doesn't feel like the long-term answer but the optics piece of the citizen it's really, really easy to feel bad for the small guy getting punched really hard in the face. Yeah, that's Even the though big... we watched him like punching the big guy in the gut like over and over and over and over and over again and cracking ribs and like, you know, 1,500 people. How many hostages? Two to 300 or something yeah, like that? Something like that. Fewer now. That's the whole goal in asymmetrical warfare. Asymmetry being you've got the small guy and the big guy and internationally, it's almost always going to feel better to support the small guy, almost well, irrespective of the behavior that they like, exhibit. You know what they good? say in an uh-huh. insurgency? Do you know the side that wins in an insurgency? The side that doesn't have the helicopters. It's kind of an old, old saying. So Explain. So uh, usually the, the country that's trying to do counterinsurgency has helicopters and they have um, all this high tech. But they don't have the embedded guerrilla fighters. Yeah. And, the, uh, yeah, and so uh, how do you get that back? Well, now we have our own guerrilla fighters. You know what? You go take back your country. You capture or kill every single one of these Hamas dudes. And you take back your country and you'll become the core of the new Gaza, the core of, of the legislature mm. in your country. We'll have democratic elections, and we'll kind of take it from there. And they could turn that country into a paradise. What do they have that many other countries in the Middle East and, and um, that the, in the Middle East and Africa don't have? Steady access to power. They're right next to Israel. Steady access to power, fiber optic cable, water provided by Israel. All right? They got three things that's the recipe for 
a, a society that can become um, a technical powerhouse. I could see the new Silicon Valley. They got some good engineers there. They're mm -hmm. able to dig up pipes and turn them into missiles. Let's get them working for Apple. Mm -hmm. I understand what you're saying, um, and it's an attractive prospect, I think, for a Western state of mind. But I think for a lot of the people that live in these territories, it's not a matter of we just want to be economically prosperous. We just want to be, you know, Silicon Valley 2.0. We just want to get educated and become productive. It's we feel like we've lost a great deal of territory that by historical right is ours and you know economics be damned we're going to fight forever until we have it back which i don't support but the i think the yeah. mode of thinking is more in that and then you and the seminoles can get together and go bowling okay well that's, you know <laughs> they like could. that's okay what is your you um do you mind saying were you active duty during any of uh the like I iraq operations yeah i was in iraq okay uh, it's something that you brought up earlier that I'm kind of curious about because you, um, uh, Kyla had a tweet of yours where you talked about how a lot of buddies were your, of yours were upset after the pullout after Afghanistan. Yeah, I thing. was never in Afghanistan, yeah. but uh, there was a guy named Carl Higby who was mm -hmm. one of my Newsmax colleagues, and um, you know it was after he watched the uh, the testimony, some of the former generals who coordinated the evacuation of Afghanistan, and he was angry, and. At the time of the of the evacuation of Afghanistan, I was working for Accenture, and probably about one third of my Accenture colleagues were former military, some of whom had been in Afghanistan, and there were guys who were. And I don't want to get your stream shut down, but You're there were fine. guys who were very upset to the point where they were wondering why they why they are still around, right? Like, what 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 do we do this for? We lost friends. When you say upset, and, upset because of uh, people dying during the pullout, or upset because the mission seemed like it was in futility after it was in left? futility. Okay. We, you know, we we. It's like we almost freaking had it, almost had it. You know, we 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 set the Afghans up for success. You go to Kabul, one third of their uh, Shira Jirga, Jirga Shira. One third of the, the, those were women, you know. We had, I mean, look, you're never going to see women running around in bikinis like you do in in, um, in Miami. But, you're, you know, the, the women there could at least own a business. They could serve in the legislature. They become doctors. They become lawyers. It's like we almost freaking had it. And maybe if it took another 10 years, it took another 20 years, and, like, all the older people who remember the Taliban got old and they died or whatever, like, maybe we could have made that, turned that into something. And guys were beside themselves guys at Accenture were beside themselves I was checking on people it, it, that was that was a hard that was a hard day and there there are still people um you know who just kind of wonder like what what was this for and at least I can look at Iraq and go you know what we have the Iraqis are like the Germans in the Middle East like these guys like, we have they start businesses they work they you know they're they're very um they're very industrious people Iraqis are very industrious people uh, and I, that country is going to, it can be a paradise still, you know. And so Iraq worked, for lack of a better term. They're still an unstable democracy. They're, they're getting it, though. Like, it's, they're, they're, they're putting the pieces together, right? And I think, I think that country, uh, especially w where they are and with their manufacturing and their knowledge base and uh, Western-leaning people, it, it, I mean, you could, have a paradise, you could have a powerhouse in the Middle East with Iraq. Uh, so Iraq worked. But Afghanistan, like you guys who, who gave their limbs, who their buddies died, and they go like, "Why?" Do you think it's that? Horrible. Do you think that's ordinary that once soldiers come back from being deployed, do you think the average deployed person mm -hmm. in active duty very closely follows a conflict, or do you think once they come home they disconnect and they don't want to hear about it? I think it depends. I think it depends. Like there's some dudes who are just like, "Yeah, somebody to the next war, let's go." Mm -hmm. You know, uh, there's some dudes that don't want to go back and they might like, all right, well, I'm going to get a job. Um, I'm going to get a job doing, uh, you know, a, a, a training unit so I don't have to at least get deployed for another three years. I'm going to become a drill sergeant. So I got to go to the school that buys me six months and I'll go. To, I'll be on the trail for three years and maybe this conflict will be over by then. So I think it depends on, on the kind of soldier and what they want to do. There are some people who are straight up sociopaths, about 2%. I would say about 2% of the military are straight-up sociopaths, and they're like, yeah, let's go. Let's freaking do it. I want to do it again. You know, and that's, I mean, that's, that's, that is one way of looking at it. I was more of like the, all right, well, I mean, I, I will tell you, I, I, I gave up the love of my life 
to go on the road. You know, um, I gave up the love of my life. A, a woman who, uh, who, you know, she said, if you go, you know, I, I was doing QRF quick reaction force at this one Ford operating base. And, you know, I got an opportunity to go outside the wire. And I was, you know, I was lifting weights every day and eating steak, you know. I was jacked, you know. And uh, this opportunity came up. I'm like, I know how to do this, and I like it. And I told this girl, like, you know, listen, I'm, I'm going outside the wire. And she was like, um, if you do that, you're not coming back to me. Now, funny story <laughs> about that. I actually, I was involved in, in, a, in a dangerous situation. This girl was Jewish, by the way. I was Is that involved. the danger? No, I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I don't know. What? It, sorry? It was that the dangerous yeah. situation. Oh, a lot of dangerous so, situations. Oh, God. <laughs> so what's funny is that um, this girl, she, uh, I really liked her. Like, if I had gone left instead of right, a house, white picket fence, you know, whatever, right? Instead, I went the other way. And... As, and I say to myself, like, oh, I went the other way because because wanting to go to college shouldn't be a death sentence. I am a good, oh, I think it was a staff sergeant at the time. I'm a good staff sergeant. I'm a good platoon sergeant. I know how to keep these guys alive. I can teach them stuff to keep them alive. I can, you know, whatever, right? And, um, you know, the, uh, the truth is that I liked it. I liked it. I, I mean, like, that's, 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 a, that's kind of a horrible thing to say. Like, all right. I'm going to get down on this road. I'm going to drive down this road. And maybe you'll get me today. Maybe you won't. That's a hell of a feeling. It's almost like driving in Miami. I, <laughs> I will tell you, I will tell you, driving in Miami is kind of like, like playing, him, actually. Kind of like terrifying. playing Frogger, but in reverse. You're the cars. It, it seems like people in Miami just decide, you know what? I need to be on the other side of this road right now. It doesn't matter where they are, Vaya con Dios, and they just head right across the road. Maybe you hit them, maybe you don't, mm -hmm. right? Um, but I will tell you that the, the funny story is I was involved in one dangerous situation on the road, and, like, you know, afterwards, uh, when I got home, I went and talked to my girl's rabbi, and I asked him, like, do you think, do you think maybe God has a special plan for me? And the rabbi, you know, he looks at me and he goes, Maybe God had a special plan for someone else in the vehicle. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I'm an atheist, so don't care about that. <clears throat> Do you think um, I have questions about China, Taiwan? Mm -hmm. I've got a specific Israel question. Mm -hmm. Got a broad, fun question. Not mm -hmm. really that fun. And then China, Taiwan. Something I argue about a lot with people. You can tell me if you agree or disagree. Mm -hmm. Give me your perspective mm -hmm. on it, especially as it's kind of in your, kind of in your ballpark. Mm -hmm. um, I argue a lot about whether or not soldiers are intentionally targeting civilians. Mm -hmm. is, is the thing that comes up a lot when we talk about war crimes yeah. and bad behavior and everything. And a concept that people seem to have a lot of trouble with is if somebody were to tell me that a soldier shot a civilian mm -hmm. in cold blood with a white flag up, as horrible as that is, and it is horrible, my, op, my, my prior assumptions on that before learning any other information is that like I could see that happening, especially depending yeah. on the conflict. I could totally see that happening. Yeah. Um, to where there was no military purpose, just straight out just killing a civilian because they're so mm -hmm. upset or angry. However, people take that same type of assumption and they'll apply it to airstrikes. Mm -hmm. And my understanding is, is when you're talking about basically any munition that's being yeah. dropped or even drone that's being operated, yeah. It's never just one guy doing this particular thing. You've got a whole strike cell, top to bottom, mm -hmm. commanders, maybe a lawyer, a ton of uh, intel, weaponeering, mm -hmm. a whole bunch of stuff going on. And that to claim that a particular strike was done on some civilians just to kill civilians with no other goal in mind, that I think on my end, I might have a hard time believing that maybe even, I don't even know necessarily, I would say Russia, I would say I would need a lot of information to really believe that because that's an exceptional claim. Yeah. Do you think there's a difference between these two things? Do you think I'm putting too much weight on the on the top-down structure? or? So I can tell you there is a non-zero chance that you have a sociopathic soldier, a sociopathic Israeli soldier who's like, you know, no one's around. I'm going to plug this guy. Mm -hmm. I've always wanted to see what happens. For sure. Someone in that. There is a 100 – there is a non-zero chance that happened. I don't say there's a 100% chance, but there's always sociopaths. I, I've met them myself. I'm like, dude, why did you do that? Mm-hmm. You know, or guys who like they'll go right up to the edge of the law war, 
There was this one guy I know. He was a National Guard guy who uh, he had been. A, he was a sniper in the Guard, and he was a. Uh, he had been a policeman in uh, this one town. It was Princeton, and he had been involved in two shootings in Princeton. Hmm. I was like, Princeton? How much violent crime is going on in Princeton? And you know, like it could just be some cop who's like, you know what? I could, I could de-escalate and I could take the situation down a notch, but if I escalate a little bit and I shoot this guy, I'll still be justified and I can I can get away with it. I want to see what happens. So I have no doubt in my mind there are Israeli soldiers who are doing that. I have no doubt in my mind there's Hamas soldiers who are doing that too. You know, I want to, I mean, these dudes are, are shooting people who are cowering under desks and stuff. That takes, that takes some, that takes some, uh, some uh, certain type of conviction certain type of conviction, yes right? yeah. <laughs> so um the the issue that i can see with with the weaponeering is that uh, an item like a hellfire missile costs about one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. so whenever you see someone fire a, a hellfire missile just like when i talk about the the javelin when you fire a javelin i want you to imagine a ferrari going out a window like in ferris Bueller's day off when you see someone fire a um, Hellfire, I want you to imagine a Mercedes G-Wagon falling out of the sky and crushing somebody. Because that's how much a Hellfire missile costs, about $150,000. You're not shooting them at people for the lulls. Right? If you're shooting a missile at somebody, they're probably a bad dude. Is there a specific chain that goes up? Like I imagine kill chain. A, a, that is the kill chain. Okay, <laughs> I was gonna say if it's 150 G's, like I can definitely see like the sociopathic IDF soldier or the Hamas soldier, like with their own gun going through places and popping somebody off. Yeah. But 150 G's, I feel like there has to be enough bureaucracy to account for yeah, that type. Yeah, you're of error. you're going up. So in a in a in a coin environment, yeah, you're going up. Hey, is this Daddy El Batty? Yeah, we're pretty sure it's Daddy El Batty. All right. Sometimes you accidentally hit Batty El Daddy. Oh crap. You know, kind of like that, that what was a burn after reading. What did we learn? Well, I guess we learned not to do that again. Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> like sometimes that does happen. That's how the U.S. drops a bomb in a wedding party. Right. All right. You got bad intel. Sorry. It sucks. I, mean, I hate to put it that way, but, you know, you drop enough bombs, eventually you're going to be dropping a bomb on somebody you shouldn't be dropping a bomb on. In terms right. of oversight for strikes, do you think that mortar attacks fall closer to the missile attack like chain of command, or do you think it falls closer to the individual no, soldier shooting? No, if you're if you're using a mortar, it's at the company level. Okay, you have company mortars. A uh, company is about it's. Is there any check? Like, would uh, the guy running the mortar and loading it? It's two or three men teams. Yeah, two right? or three guy teams. Yeah. Would they have to at least check with their sergeant before they can hit the trigger, or can the three man team themselves? Typically, what you get is a fire. What's called a fire mission. Uh -huh. So all that's been pre pre planned out. So you have the infantry guys. And they're moving, and usually have integrated mortars, or you might have battalion level mortars. It depends on the organization of the unit. Yeah. But you might be, you might hit some thing, and all right, in your op, op order, your operations order, you have all right. Here's what to do if you want to request mortars, and here are the mortars that we have on standby if you do need mortars. And you different units like, hey, Alpha Company, Alpha Company, you get priority for HE high explosive mortars. Bravo Company, you're next in priority, um, uh, but uh, Charlie Company, you can only ask for smoke because we have all the HE, the high explosive, dedicated toward Bravo and, and Alpha, and mm -hmm. anyway, Alpha always gets precedent. So typically, the, the good guys, they, they find the bad guys, they need mortars, they're going to call up to the FDC, the Fire Direction Center, and the FDC is going to say, okay, uh, what's your target? Give me the, the grid coordinates, description of the target ammunition you want you're getting whatever they give you but you know and, you yeah. know you can you can you can you know while we're dreaming i want a pony right you can ask for dpicm doesn't mean you're getting it so you you call up your request and they process that and they've already figured out that the the um the, the different sectors where they're allowed to, to shoot mortars in okay so, the so there's FTC, a bit more of a kill chain with a mortar than just a guy with a pistol oh absolutely but not as much obviously as a hundred fifty thousand dollar missile no no with a hundred fifty thousand dollar missile there was a guy there was a video al jazeera put it out i'm going to do a video on it soon where um this uh an israeli drone launched a missile at four dudes gone oh this just came out it's uh, just within came the past out week. and i looked at this and actually no it weapons. was two missiles walking no weapons you know look if you are an insurgent and you're not wearing a uniform, you're still a valid target. And I'll tell you something. These must have been bad dudes because 
uh, an ISR bird, intelligence surveillance reconnaissance bird, that kind of drone with that kind of resolution. That wasn't some that wasn't some uh, some company guy who threw a, a Raven, who threw like a small unit drone. That was that was a larger drone, right? That was dropping those rocks, right? So and there's I, I actually two of talk, them, right? And there was two, there's two missiles, that. right? So that that probably went all the way up to Netanyahu. Like, yeah, take those guys out. I think the frustrating thing about those situations, uh, when you analyze them, is I just don't think people understand the strength. I argued Finkelstein mm -hmm. and, and Moline about this. People don't understand the strength of the claim they're making when they say that they were civilians intentionally killed. Because you're talking about, what, maybe a dozen or more people all saying, we are going to shoot a $150,000 bomb to kill four civilians for yeah. no reason because it would be really funny. And that that is a an insanely, that would be just yeah. crazy. Impossible? No, maybe not impossible, but you're at such a level of unhinged operation in the military that you would imagine stuff like that would be occurring. Is there any level, often. maybe I'll play like mm -hmm. the devil's advocate. Is there any level of like uh, bigotry, extremism? Obviously they probably hate these guys. They've killed their family members. They've been dogging Israel forever. Mm -hmm. Where a 12 man chain, or I don't know if it's 12 man, maybe that's hyperbolic, yeah. could ever say those four civilians, honestly, it's sketchy. It's hard to know if they're actually a problem, but you know, screw them, let's just shoot it. That's, yeah, that's is possible. That, it is possible? It, it, All so the way I up think, to I think yeah. in, in a case like that, what you have is we don't have 100% confidence, boss. What do you want to do? Okay. Let's hit them. Or intelligence that's a little bit off or maybe too biased in one direction. Or it, was bad, it, was, it was baddie yell daddy instead of daddy yell daddy. Mm -hmm. Ooh, we got that one wrong. Let's not do that one again, right? Or like, well, we got them, but um, I don't know if they're the bad guys or not, but they were probably bad guys. You know, why were they walking here? I mean, I, when I watched the video, there was actually another dude who was behind a wall, which I saw, and the dude like popped up and was popping down again. I'm like, all right, so you're a lookout. All right. Why do you have a lookout? You have a lookout because that guy is looking out for, you know, something you shouldn't be doing. And they, what's funny is the lookout, after those four guys were hit, the lookout suddenly decided he needed to be someplace else. And he's walking away like, <laughs> oh, I hope I don't get a... Now, I don't know if a Hellfire was shot. It could have been um, a, uh, they're called a Spice, which uh, you can probably Google that one. It, it's, uh, oh, God, it's, uh, I think, special low-cost SP... Special precision, <laughs> I see cost. So smaller the blades or whatever that comes. No, nah, they're thinking of the ninja. Oh, no, yeah, the yeah. the spice. It's a uh, it's a it's a glide kit that they put on dumb bombs. The Israelis only the Israelis use it. What's kind of neat is that the spice bomb has a uh, a seeker in it that can use uh, preloaded photographs. Mm -hmm. So like you can actually let it glide to the target and it'll figure out how it has to get there without a laser just by going, all right, well, does this, this picture looks similar to the picture I have in memory. So, you know, right. so it's probably a spice bomb. And again, Israel doesn't, Israel doesn't uh, disclose how much different weapon systems cost, yeah. but you figure a JDAM joint direct attack munition costs about 20,000 to $38,000 a pop. This one, since it has some of the, the analytics on board uh, and pattern matching and AI on board, then you're probably talking about 50,000. So now you're talking about a, oh, now you're dropping a, a Jeep Wrangler uh, a Rubicon <laughs> on someone. It Instead sucks a, to change the terminology that is used for the sake of public discourse, but I really don't like the expression dumb bomb. I hate that expression because yeah. when people hear and people have used the term dumb bomb, yeah. they're using that uh, they're using that to say totally unguided, indiscriminate munition, which is absolutely not the case. Just because a weapon itself might not have like uh, a, a way to navigate or change, you know, trajectory mid-flight yeah. doesn't mean that you're shooting blindly. And I've noticed that when people talk about the war in Gaza, mm -hmm. that gets brought up instantly. They're like, they're using dumb bombs, they're using dumb bombs, they're using dumb bombs. But it's like these are coming from planes or they're being fired out of cannons that are like Pretty yeah, accurately targeted, but yeah. Yeah, they, they, they have a computer mm -hmm. system that'll project a reticle, a circle, mm -hmm. on what that bomb is going to hit. And then you let that go, it just follows gravity. Mm -hmm. And it's not, so it's precise enough with that aiming system that you'll hit a building with a precision guided bomb. You'll hit the, you'll, you can get through the window, mm -hmm. right? We put a hellfire through this window right here, you know? And just, and that's part of weaponeering, right? All right, do I want to take out the room? Do I want to take out the floor? Do I want to take out the building? I want to take out the room. All right, we need a small diameter bomb. I want to take out the floor. All right, we need a thousand pounder. 
Hmm. I'll tell you the building, right? We need a couple of 2,000 pounders at, you know, these spaces. Yeah. That all depends on, on, on weapons effects on target, what you want to do. Yeah. I also don't like the, um, I don't like that when people get killed on the ground, we can disprove it based on observers in the area that mm -hmm. have no idea. So for instance, um, with those four men that were killed by the one mm -hmm. strike, and then without diving into an opening of a whole other can of worms, there's another strike um, over a decade ago where four kids were killed on a beach in Gaza um, that Israel did. And the counter to this is Israel will say, oh, well, we had reason to believe this or that. And people will say, well, actually, people on the ground didn't see that which isn't really a refutation of what the supposed intelligence will be. So for instance, uh, four journalists might be in a building and they'll see, oh, well, that guy looked innocent that he got killed, so he must have been a civilian. And all of a sudden, like a eyewitness testimony on the ground will be a refutation of any of the claims made by the actual attacking party, which is also very frustrating. There are a couple of journalists who were killed recently because they launched a drone. That's not, yeah. And Israel was like, these guys launching a drone. All right, well, they're wearing vests that say press. Are they reporters? I don't know. They just launched a drone. Hit him. I mean, was that the right thing to do? I mean, all right. Well, it's, it's not beyond the pale that, that someone in Hamas put on a press vest. And well, yeah. if we launch this drone, we can say that we're press and maybe they won't shoot at us. Yeah. What's Here, your question? Uh, here's a challenging question, yeah. though. Uh, oh, I didn't have a question. I was just complaining. It's oh, okay. Very okay. Irritating. You're just whining. Yeah. Gotcha, gotcha. Um, here is a question, though. Should there be some kind of verification for, I feel like it's strange that we have no insight. So mm -hmm. a military will never publish, for instance, or I don't believe there's ever been a publishing of how they'll do a proportionality analysis. Like, is it worth it to kill this many civilians for this type of military? Like, people don't publish that information. But it's not inconceivable that, uh, let's say we could hack the Israeli database and we look mm -hmm. and we see their math is, uh, 500 Palestinians are worth one ground level Hamas soldier. We can imagine that they would have a calculation where we mm. would go, this is wildly disproportionate. We're not even in the ballpark yeah. of what would be acceptable. But we, nobody has access to that information. I don't think even ICC, ICJ stuff mm -hmm. doesn't dig that information out. Do you think that there should be some way that, if not civilians, at least other countries or international courts should have some oversight into how that's handled? Like how does a country do distinction or proportionality or? Probably not because that would that would really empower your adversaries to do things like hide among the population. Like yeah, there is some published table of. So as long as they set the threshold at like ten people, then it's always then you'll you'll by ten people. Yeah, they would. Yeah, they would just play that game. But then you can see the okay. you can see the argument on the other side, right? To where. Let's say that a building is destroyed. Let's say two Hamas mm -hmm. operatives are killed, not leaders, not C2, whatever, mm -hmm. just two Hamas operatives are killed and 450 civilians die. Yeah. And Israel goes, we didn't know that many civilians were in the building. It could be that, well, when they do their calculations, that's a totally acceptable trade-off to them, but we have no way of knowing that. Do you think that that lack of insight, I, I understand from yeah. the operational side, the belligerent doesn't want to have yeah. to publish that information. But yeah, as a civilian or as a, as a third party organization or, or people who aren't party to the conflict, we kind of want to know to make sure that people aren't making crazy stuff. I don't think it would matter. What is the ratio? Yeah. No like one knows. Who decides yeah. the life, right? I mean, that, mm -hmm. that's kind of decided by, decided by an attorney. Yeah. And the, you know, that, that could be dynamic. Like, hey, we're getting a lot of pressure from Washington. So now the threshold is down to, to 10. You can't kill more than 10 civilians for every bad guy. All right, so if we got to go over time, we got to call the White House. How would you ensure that a military is following proportionality assessments of what they roughly should be? If we think of like LOAC, international humanitarian guidelines, if we if we have no insight into any of that whatsoever. In the American military, it's because we said we're doing it. Sure. And that's like I I can tell you, um, <clears throat> well, you know, one of my favorite stories is um, you know I've I've never seen I've never once seen an American mistreated prisoner. Now I'm dealing with a very small sample set. Mm -hmm. on two eyes. I, was say, I think Abu Ghraib or whatever that <coughs> Abu Ghraib was horrible, Grabe, yeah. and we punished those people. Mm -hmm. yeah. And um, Abu Ghraib was a, uh, it was, uh, there was this reservist MP unit that didn't really know what they were doing. They didn't know how to do corrections. And I, I honestly think some intel guys were like, hey, why don't you go do this? This would be cool. Do this. And they're kind of egging them on. And they, like, were piling. Like, one woman was, you know, one MP had his dog have sex with a woman. 
one uh, you know, they were piling men in, in naked piles, m making men masturbate, you know, in front of women. Like, yeah, I was gonna say because when you say egg and one, that sounds like you're mm -hmm. saying like sneak something dumb into this guy's food. They would have pretty horrible stuff. A lot they of did, like sexual related they stuff. They did some probably. horrible yeah. like yeah. like I can say stuff. Like look, I can understand like you know look you, you you might be moving a prisoner. You might not be that gentle with the guy mm -hmm. if you have to move a prisoner from place to place. But when some MP goes, I got an idea. Let's take my dog. Whoa, Bob, are you okay at home there? You know, like, how do you even think of that? Like, that's never once entered my mind. As you said, there's like people, right? like military, unfortunately, is going to have a bit of a selection bias in that like people probably who want to do violence, who are inclined toward it, and can do sanctioned violence, are probably more likely to join things like police forces and military. Yeah, and they'll than, give me a medal. Yeah, yeah. You know? exactly. Um, well, that is true, But in, in a... One story I've told is there was a, an Iraqi prisoner who asked, who was asking me, Maya, Maya, Maya. You know, this prisoner who wants water. You know, I can speak a little bit Arabic. I'm not, not as good as I was. But I can speak a little. And I talk like an Egyptian, which is better than walking like an Egyptian or driving like one. And uh, How does an Egyptian walk? What does that mean? <laughs> it's, a, it's a song. Walk like an Egyptian. Dun, 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 okay, dun, sorry, dun. keep going. I've never heard this. Now you got a copyright. <laughs> <story. laughs> Great, yeah. <laughs> Well, it was a song about the Bengals. Okay. Uh, so uh, the the um, this guy was at Maya Maya, and I was I went and got him some water. He had his blindfold on, he was handcuffed. I gave him some water, and he started going cult, cult, cult. I was like cult. I'm trying to think what what does that mean? I'm like what word is cult? And then I realized he was saying cold, the English word for cold. Mm. And I was like Baruda. He's like yeah. I'm like, I'm not West Baruta Maya. They don't even give me cold water. <laughs> like, I, I don't have cold water. You want me to give you cold water? Like, the stone's on this guy. Right? But he wasn't, like, physically cold? No, he wanted cold water. Oh. Like, that's all I got is warm water. They don't even give me cold water. You want freaking cold water? Um, so that, I, I, I think about that sometimes when I, when I hear about prisoners because, like, we always, we always treat a prisoner as well. Look, you're out of the game. You're captured. You're not my problem. You know, I'm, I'm going to treat you humanely. I'm not going to give you any special favors, but I'm going to treat you humanely. We're going to search, segregate speed, uh, silence, and safeguard. Get you to the rear. That's one of the five S's, which is an acronym. We're going to get you to the rear. We're going to, you know, make sure that you're protected and get you food. Um, so we never, we never did that. So I, when it comes to following the law, we're following the law act because we're the American army, and that's what we do. And there's, I, there's always going to be eight jerks. Right, there's always going to be people who are like, "Ooh, let's well, let, me, let me shoot some guy in the head. I want to see what happens." Oh, did you ever see a head come apart like that? Yeah, and I got away with it. I have a theory idea about this, and then I have a direct counter that means my theory is wrong, and then I want you to explain mm -hmm. why it's wrong. Okay. Um, I go back to my time as a gamer again. Mm -hmm. uh, it seems like it's very easy to impersonally be mean to people. Go on Twitter, talk mm -hmm. shit. In a video game, if somebody's typing, it's very easy to be mean to somebody. League. Um, when voice chat is activated, mm -hmm. it's really hard to be as mean as you were when you were typing, because now there's yeah. voices involved. And I feel like in real life even, depending on the demeanor of the people, it takes a special kind of person to be really mean or evil towards somebody who is always take combat, out of service, not mm -hmm. capable of doing anything, even in a civilian yeah. state, to just beat on somebody um, emotionally or physically. It's really mm -hmm. hard. It takes a special kind of horrible thing. And I feel like even in military environments, that must be true to some extent, that it's really hard to find a person to be that evil. But then my question would be is there have been regimes yeah. uh, with, you know, um, I think, Vietnam Japan. War, I think in Japan, where you've had prisoners of war that were mm -hmm. institutionally, systematically tortured, or yeah. were treated horrible by, by the by the holders of the prisoners. How does that happen? What's what do you think is going on there? I could just be cultural. I mean, the the Germans were very proud of how they treated their prisoners. I mean, there there were some prison camps where the prisoners are being fed better than the guards in Germany. But in Japan, I think it like the idea of surrender at that time. It just wasn't concept wait i gotta push on that you said in germany they treated the prisoners well generally for world war ii during world war ii captured airmen oh maybe airmen i've heard for pilots there's like a special type but, but like in world war ii didn't <clears throat> they ship off i thought they killed like five or five or six million soviets in the concentration camps didn't they 
I am not aware of that, but that that might be a subject that I don't. That's a different. Okay, I yeah, think that, Japan that might is be... notorious for like war crimes yeah. against their prisoners. <clears> but when like you're when you're game. looking at how the Germans treated Allied soldiers, especially air crew that bailed out, which is really my only touchstone okay. around this kind of thing. I don't consider myself a, a World War II historian. Sure, but I I have read uh, Stalag Seventeen, and there was another book that came out about a castle where all the escape attempts happen from i know that in some cases guards were being fed less than, than the prisoners because the germans they, they were very proud of their martial abilities and and they were going to stick to the laws of war and they really didn't shoot at medics and they you know you, they could be counted on to follow the law of war at least against the, the western front maybe not the jews yeah. but not against you know their not victims. against the jews but yeah. against the americans against the french british yeah okay but um, the Japanese, I think, just in their their um, uh, samurai culture, it's like, well, surrender. What's surrender? You know, surrender. You dishonor yourself. You, you should commit Harry carry, right? You commit seppuku, right? Kill yourself. I don't want to get you demonetized, but like, delete yourself, <laughs> right? Like, yeah. delete yourself, right? So uh, I think the Japanese just had too much of a of a grounding in in uh, warrior shogun culture or samurai culture i'm sorry mm -hmm. i guess i guess i'm not convinced that it's cultural like at all like when i look at like studies of mm -hmm. um you know you've got like the classic like stanford prison experiment mm -hmm. but more importantly to me is actually the have you guys i'm sure you've probably heard of it as well the, the study um i can't remember his name right now it starts with an m but where they have people shocking victims. I've heard um, of that. Yeah, of the, like, like the keep training. doing. Yeah, the lethal dose. It's, uh, Milgram. The yeah. Milgram. Which is kind of weird too, because it's like, hold up, I'm a grad student. I'm getting paid five bucks an hour. You want me to electrocute somebody? This can't be real. Like, who who did they pick to do these studies? What kind of idiots gonna been, think oh, I'm gonna yeah. kill someone today? Yeah, well, I mean, even like, if you thought it wasn't real, that'd be all the more reason not to do it then. No. No, they oh, definitely I want thought my five dollars. Yeah, they definitely right. thought it was real in the good studies but like mm -hmm. what, when you look at this it seems like like i don't know if i'm convinced that like any single person is super far away from doing atrocities the rape of of nanking or Jean king i always say it incorrectly but i think it's nanking nanking yeah. yeah i feel like there's a really interesting book on it and one of the boys who was involved he's like a 17 year old boy mm -hmm. he's super old now obviously talks about how within 30 days he went from being like kind of a mama's boy mm -hmm. at home in japan to cold-heartedly and uncaringly like shooting a mother and her baby and like celebrating and getting excited because he was able to kill both of them in like one shot mm -hmm. um and so i do think that there are like psychopaths mm -hmm. um she really wants a pet hey, buddy. <laughs> Sorry. How you doing? Um, good time she's trail. a good girl she is a good girl um but i and, and maybe this is to you i don't really see it as like this unique thing that occurs i think it's something that has to be actively mostly refrained from in warfare i feel mm -hmm. like any structural institution probably more so has to steer their soldiers away from that especially because the people who are under their prisoner of war mm -hmm. look like the same guy who just killed their buddy or look like the same people that they're being kind of taught to ignore and kill over and over and over, especially in like World War II. Mm -hmm. And maybe that doesn't translate to modern warfare because we're so much further away from the people that we're killing. Um, but I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. Yeah, I'm not sure. I'm not sure either. I think that there there is... So uh, there was a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Steve Grossman who wrote a book called On Killing, which a lot of people say is a bunch of BS. But uh, one, of his, uh, one of his ideas is it's called operant conditioning. So back during World War II, study was done, some people say the study was flawed, that only 20% of all infantrymen actually shot their rifles at the enemy. Uh -huh. Right. And then by Vietnam, that ratio is up to like 90%. And that's because by Vietnam, we have these pop-up targets, right? The target pops up, you see it, you shoot the target. There's a sensor that, go that detects the bullet, the target goes down. Pop-up targets, right? In training. In training. And during Vietnam, like the advent of these, you know, nothing on the battlefield looks like a bullseye. Back in World War II, we were teaching people how to shoot at bullseyes. Well, it looks like a bullseye. Nothing. Right? So now you're trying to shoot at a dude. And what's crazy is dudes, like, they, they actually do look a lot like these pop up targets. It is kind of weird. They pop up. And like, oh my God, that's a, you know. And um, it, it's surprisingly effective. But one of the things he says is that we never teach people that killing is okay. The killing 
And I, I don't like it because like, he goes into like make it a righteous kill. You know, when you stand before your maker, like okay, dude, I I, I got you. You know, I, I'm picking up what you're putting down, mm-hmm. right? Um, but we we never teach people that it is ethical to kill. That's just not something that the army does, and that's that's one of the things that one of the reasons why PTSD may be so widespread because we. We, we tell people for 18 years, killing is wrong, killing is wrong, killing is wrong. Then we give them a 13-week course, we hand them a rifle, and we go, okay, go kill. Over there, go kill. It doesn't work. It doesn't work. They might be able to, to reflexively kill because they've, they have that operant conditioning. Target comes up, target goes down, right? But then afterwards, they're, oh, my God, I just killed some dude. Right. Oh, my God, I just shot this guy. His intestines fell off, and he was still running. His intestines were trailing out behind him, and then he fell on the ground dead. And they gave me a medal. Right. Like, they don't teach you how to deal with that. Edgy you know? question. Yeah. Not really edgy. I don't want to call it edgy. Actually. I think it's an interesting question. Do you think that civilians should be forced to watch hardcore military videos before they make votes or decisions on if we should go to war with countries? No. <laughs> like, what forced? To, what do you got to do? It's like, like uh, what was that, Clockwork Orange? You put their eyes open like that? They got to watch? No. Why? Absolutely not. I think they should be. No, I was just saying. Why I do you mean, want them to? I mean, knock yourself out. I, I, uh, I don't think you can force anybody to do anything. Well, you know. Well, within reason force. Why yeah. do you want civilians to have to see that before they vote on military actions? Um, sometimes I feel like it's it's interesting, but ever since um, what World War II, I think we were very much a country at war, and then probably past World War II, um, the conflict feels a lot more foreign, yeah. and especially once we hit first Gulf War, second Gulf War, stuff is just kind of happening. People don't have much of an idea about it, and I feel like when the American mind is thinking about foreign policy, it's very short term. Yeah. And the idea, I guess, of a population, a democratic society, because we are, that we vote on things that could be having unbelievable impacts on other people's lives. It's interesting to me sometimes that a person might vote in favor of invading, cooing, destroying a certain country, mm-hmm. but they couldn't even watch a video of a person dying or of something related to it happening. Yeah, like, not everybody does that anyway. <coughs> I mean, the Army's tooth to tail ratio is you know, something like one to five. I believe so. Tooth to tail, meaning tooth, meaning the guys that pull the trigger. Mm-hmm. Tail is all the logistics. Yeah, that that, that uh, feed them, they give them the, the dental care, the you know the the equipment to go fight. I want to say it's one to five. I did a video about this, so it's, it, it goes back and forth. You know, logistics. So like when you want to get technical, uh, four fifths of the army is logistical. They're never going to shoot anybody, ever. You know, they're they're dealing with like, hey, my job is to move these pallets from here to here. <laughs> you know, like that's that's kind of that's kind of so uh, for the most part, like the only people that ever see the horrible combat is the infantry guys, the armor guys, and the cav guys. Do you think if that- you change your mind significantly based on seeing videos, mm-hmm. do you think you have a right to vote for it otherwise? Like, does we it don't sound- vote for that, right? I mean, it's Congress that decides whether... Well, but I mean, we vote for our congressmen. We they roughly try to track on to what we want as a population. Yeah, that, that, that kind of sounds like... You've been playing uh, what was that thing? Uh, Hellraisers two or something like oh, that. Hell divers. Hell divers. <laughs> Everyone, hell divers. Manage democracy, right? I'm 35 now. I'm an make... adult. I don't play video games anymore, but I've heard of the game. Yeah. <laughs> I don't play video games either, but I, I know of hell divers because it appeared all over YouTube mm-hmm. within just minutes. I guess it's a really good game. Yeah. Um, but uh, Hellraiser, God, that's I'm showing my age. That was a that was a big movie back in the 90s. Series of movies, the pin. Pinhead. In the box. In the yeah. box. I remember that. Box. Yeah, it just feels like even the four to one is interesting to me as mm-hmm. somebody who's done like, obviously addictions is very different, mm-hmm. but the experience of being like a frontline worker mm-hmm. in addictions can be extremely frustrated by the bureaucracy behind you making policies and decisions where you're like, you like this is, I think even in the military, I could be wrong, but my understanding is like there's a very large tension between like the sergeants and like the frontline mm-hmm. workers versus officers who are in offices and doing all the pencil pushing and stuff because they don't really understand each other. And I feel like there's this interesting question of like, if, if we understood better what these like frontline guys were mm-hmm. experiencing, going through, and what we're asking of them, like what the gravity of what is going on mm-hmm. was understood, not just through the whole bureaucracy of the military, but into the citizens as well, 
would it change the way that like all of us are engaging in like warfare specifically? And I don't really mm. know the answer. I suspect that we would engage in some of the wars just identically and others we might like pull back from. Um, but it's something that I worry about, like especially in the age of misinformation uh, with TikTok and whatnot, mm. that the citizens lack of understanding of what this front guy is experiencing and the decisions and the four fifths that go in behind him to making certain decisions creates this massive gap in um, decision making, in, in major political democratic decision making, uh, which means that like our voters are weighing in fundamentally on things that they can't even begin to fathom what they're weighing in on, which feels like an uninformed populace. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I would certainly say that a, a lack of military representation just in general is a big problem. I mean, uh, the past, uh, God, the past two presidents, three presidents, George H.W. Bush was the last president who had military experience. And even then, it was like a year as a fighter pilot and a National Guard unit that they called the Champagne Squadron. <laughs> you can just imagine what was going on there. Right? Oh, we fly interceptors that were, uh, that were um, <clears throat> obsolete 10 years ago, and we, uh, you know live the good life not in being in Vietnam, right? But President Obama never served in the military. President Trump never served in the military. President Biden never served in the military. Now, I don't think that it's necessary for you to serve in the military to serve our country as a politician, but it certainly does help give you some idea of what's going on on the ground, right? And I think probably the last politician, uh, well, I mean, there's something like, uh, God, what's the guy's name with the eye patch? Dan uh, Crenshaw. Dan oh. Crenshaw, he was a former Navy SEAL. Mm -hmm. Like he's he's seen combat, uh, real real honest to god combat. Uh, Democrat. Uh, I mean, McCain did pilot. as well, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Tammy Duckworth. Tammy Duckworth lost both her legs. You see, I think she was a UH sixty pilot. Lost both her legs. I want to say it was in Iraq. I will say in his defense, at least Biden had family that was that served in the military. Uh, Biden's okay. children. Yeah, uh, McCain was also yeah prisoner of war for in Vietnam. Yeah, I remember him saying, like, I'm all for reunification with Vietnam, except that, that guy used to torture me. Yeah. <laughs> it was pretty severe, too. His story, I think, was pretty exceptional. Like, I think he got captured. He refused <clears throat> release or to do videos because he was a pretty well-known person, such he that they wanted to do propaganda. He was an admiral's son, and mm -hmm. the, Vietnam, the Vietnamese wanted to release him. And one of the things all, every single soldier knows is it's called the Code of for, Conduct. Yeah. And part of the Code of Conduct is that you must be released in the order to, in which you were captured. So they wanted to release McCain before everybody else, and he said, "No, do not release me. I will not. I will not go, because other people who are captured before me are supposed to be released first. And actually, that's the whole thing. They uh, they take your picture. Uh, you actually have like a like a like a safe word. Like if you're ever uh, if you're ever captured and the special forces kick in the door, we'll say something. Like, What's your favorite restaurant? Taco Bell. And that, that's how they know it's you, right? Is they you write down some answers to questions. What was your first pet? Right, it's like like trying to get your password back. Mm -hmm. Yeah, except special forces are in yeah. the room. Hmm. Any other last questions that you had before we wrap up? <laughs> wrap up. All right. If, you don't, on, if you're ready mind. to go for another Wait, two just, hours, no, no, we won't, we won't. Go to the bathroom. I got just a couple other. You can use the restroom real quick if you want to. I got another couple topics. Okay. Sure. I'll I'll go to the bathroom after. Her. Okay. Well, okay. Slow down there. So we talk a lot about. Um, there's a thing that everybody says they don't talk about, but we yeah. kind of talk about it, but nobody's serious about it, which is cyber warfare. Mm -hmm. um, we spoke about it a little bit yesterday. But there's another topic that nobody really talks about that's also interesting to me, and I'm curious how much he's played in into each other, is space warfare. Mm -hmm. The launching of satellites, the disabling of other satellites, mm -hmm. the attacking satellites in, in orbit. Um, I guess, because I, I, I've heard the, the cyber warfare stuff a lot, and I'd be curious to get a couple of your takes on that. But mm -hmm. I'm also curious, do you study or do you know anything about the, uh, I guess, the coming battle for space for satellites yes for, yeah i made a whole video about the space force um you know there are people who don't like president trump but if he has one saving grace it is 100 percent absolutely the founding of the space force mm -hmm. you know when you have the air force is going to air force right and for the longest times kind of space is in the air force domain well who's eventually going to rise to the top of the air force it's going to be a fighter pilot right so you need a different branch that knows how to gain uh, promotions based on um, their knowledge of how to operate in space. It's one of the smartest things we did 
let's create a Space Force. Now, I know this wasn't President Trump's idea, but he's mm-hmm. the guy who got it across the finish. Yeah. A lot of people made fun of it just because it was President Trump. But yeah, there's, it I've was heard a, a lot good of, idea. Yeah. It was a good idea. And, you know, what, the Space Force, they have basically two missions. The responsible use of space, meaning we're not going to put any more space junk up there. We're going to manage the space junk we have. And also, uh, we're going to we're going to deny our adversaries access to space when it comes time to do the fight. And the Space Force actually has teams that go out. I forget which space space delta it is. But they have teams that go out that will embed with Army units, or Marine units, or Navy units. And so we can give them space capabilities. And a commander needs, a, a commander needs imagery. They send up a space testing request. I think it goes to Space Delta 8. And they, they see, all right, where does this task request need to go? Okay, we need to degrade the sensors of this enemy satellite. Where is this enemy satellite? And there are ways to degrade that enemy satellite without using any kinetic actions, so we're not putting up more space junk. There's ways of degrading that adversary satellite so that it doesn't create more debris, and then we can, uh, we can operate without the adversary seeing where we are. Okay. As so. a quick, just a quick question, mm-hmm. actually. When you talk about like shining a laser on something and destroying it, would you consider that kinetic action or no? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, you're destroying something. Okay. I mean, the kinet- the kinetics may be photons, but it's still kinetics, right? Okay. So the physical destruction of anything you'd say is yeah, kinetic action. Kinetic. Gotcha. Do um, are people worried about what satellite to satellite combat might look like, or do we typically think of like from Earth to satellite disabling stuff? Or I think people are worried. Um, and you should be worried. I don't know if you've heard of Kessler syndrome, where you know the one satellite gets destroyed and it creates this big debris field which destroys another satellite and another satellite, and then pretty soon it's like Wally, mm-hmm. where the entire Earth is surrounded by debris and we can't go into space for 150 years. That's bad. We can't do that, right? But we might be able to degrade adversary satellites through certain electronic methods that allow us to deny them access to those uh, particular assets, put it that way. Do you have any strong thoughts on whether or not Elon Musk should be enabling Starlink for countries like Russia operating in Ukraine or what that should look like or how strange that is that a single man is in charge of, yeah. that That's a strange one. I, I uh, like, mm, yes, we should totally allow Russia to use these satellites. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I, I don't know. Uh, I, I Sometimes I don't know what Elon Musk is thinking, which is funny because I drive a Tesla. It's the best car I've ever owned. I absolutely love my Tesla. Uh, I would actually say absolutely no, Russia should not be allowed to use Starlink. I don't think they are. I, I believe that Star, uh, Starlink is geofenced, so you can actually use it in Russia. I think there have been some pictures of Starlink terminals, um, uh, and I, I don't I – don't, I think it's a PSYOP. I think that's a sub. We bought these Starlink terminals for our brave soldiers in in Ukraine. Like, eh, I don't know if that's actually happening or not. Because, look, at the end of the day, Elon Musk may be somewhat of a loose cannon, uh-huh. but he still knows what side his bread is buttered on, and that yeah. side is is SpaceX. Right? I think there's actually, I think there might be federal restrictions on what he's allowed to do in terms of servicing adversaries to the United States or something. I think I thought there look, was like the guy has a security clearance. So one of the things. So what's funny is I actually have to report you yeah. because you're a Canadian and you offered me uh, a trip down here. Oh, so yeah. I have to mention that I, I've had contact with a foreign national and you offered me a hotel room and all these yeah. other things. I, you're fine. I'm fine. You're fine. We're fine. I just have to let the government know I talked to you and you offered me something. Right. I'm glad I, I found out you were Canadian because you, know, you just admit everything. You're going to be fine. Yeah. If you can wait, you know, you know that she, she has Iranian citizenship, right? She talked to you about this before. Are you serious? Yeah. Your Iranian no, citizenship? I'm just, I'm okay. no, right. um, well, in that case, it's fine because I admit it. Right? I go, like, all right, well, she's Iranian. And actually, uh, you know what? There is an Iranian woman, uh, Anna Esposita. I don't know if you can look her up or something. She is an Iranian woman who serves in the Florida legislature. And, you know, her and I, we're never going to come to an agreement on guns. But I will tell you that she is the most genuine person I think I've ever met. Because I uh, was, you know, back when the uh, Masha Amani protest started, I had, I had no idea I had so many Iranian fans. They're all writing me, Ryan, teach me how to make a bomb. Like, all right, look, number one, 
I don't know how to make a bomb. And if I don't know how to make a bomb, you don't know how to make a bomb. And if you don't know how to make a bomb, you should be making a bomb. Because there's no such thing as a bomb maker got to be, right? It's your graded pass fail on this one, okay? And, uh, you know, a year after the Mashal Amani protests, and actually during the Mashal Amani protests, oops, I just happened to release the entire Iranian police radio spectrum. <laughs> be ashamed if someone created a jammer, right? Um, I, I mean, I tried what I could. I tried, I tried, I tried to help the protesters, and I, God bless them. I love my Iranian fans. I love my Iranian fans. Um, their government, not so much, but they don't like them either. Uh, but this one woman, Anna, I, I, you can probably look her up again. Anna Esposita, I want to say her name. She has a Twitter. I, Anna's great. And uh -huh. she made a video on the anniversary of Michelle Money's death, you know, where I let her speak for like, you know, 50 minutes, 50 seconds, you know. Um, she's a Muslim and she is a representative, I think, in Orlando, an Iranian American, and very passionate about uh, women, life, freedom which is, you know, the rallying cry of the, uh, of the, um, the protesters in Iran who were, you know, look, the, the Iranians, I was evaluating this just in case we could ever take people to The Hague for war crimes, but looking at, at young people, men and women, you know, the Iranians, they were the, uh, the Basiji militia, which are basically Iranians that are, you know, paid thugs, um, they were shooting birdshot at, protesters. Mm -hmm. Birdshot is a type of shotgun round that you use for clay pigeons like you shoot, yep. Stephen. Uh -huh. um, but Do you I, shoot clay pigeons? The, uh, yeah, you you use birdshot for trap shooting. You're not using buckshot. Right. They were using birdshot on protesters. Cool. But you'll, you'll, you'll kill somebody, right? Bird you could, you could, but you're really, they're just, them a lot, you're going to damage them and you're going to have 20 of these BBs, 20 of these little BBs inside of you, and then when you go to the hospital to get them removed, you're going to get arrested. And, man, you know, i got to tell you, one of the hardest things I ever had to do, you know, I had these Iranians writing me, telling them, Ryan, teach me how to fight back. Teach me how to make a bomb. And you wonder why we have the Second Amendment. Yeah. Right? Like, like if every Iranian was able to meet every Basiji with a gun, the situation might be, might be a little different, but... Uh -huh. There, there is gun ownership in Iran, but it's mainly hunters and stuff like that. But that was hard. It was hard. Yeah. But Anna, again, you can probably Google her. I can't remember her name. It starts with an E. Yeah, people Orlando. like to Rallopedia, yeah. yeah. Broad question, I guess. We don't mm -hmm. have to get too deep into it. I'm just curious on a mm -hmm. final topic. Do you think that... Um, Wait, do you think that, did we get into a cyber warfare yet? Um, We talked a well, We didn't really talk much about it, but... I can I can talk about it. I don't have to... You do your yet. question. I don't have to pee yet. I'm yes. just broadly curious. Do you think that China-Taiwan, do you foresee that in the next five or ten years being yes. a big... Like actually for real this yeah, time? Yeah, I see I see um I see one or two things happening. Either uh this year, around October, uh China will launch a missile strike against Taiwan. What's changed? Well there's an election. That's the main thing? Yeah. Okay. They, and they have the weapons. They're not gonna be able to invade, but they'll launch a missile strike and yeah. say, Look what we can do. We can we can raise the world price of computer chips just by salvoing a couple of missiles. Yeah. Will they target like a military area? They'll well, probably target like chip fabs, maybe the military. Okay. Yeah. You know? Okay. Um, so they might do that around uh, October, and just to because what's President Biden going to do? Is he going to go to war a month before an election? Right. Hmm. Probably not. Right. So you probably think it'll be this year, October? It could be, or it will be in uh, I think uh, 2000, um, 2026, 2027, when they've built up enough forces and they've had enough time to train and they've built up their amphibious capability. Because again, it's it's uh, it's just training. Like, how do we do this thing? How do we coordinate different brigades? How what are actions on the beach? Yeah. Um, and dude, there's a, dude, Taiwan. If if Afghanistan and Vietnam got married and had a baby that would be Taiwan <laughs> because you've got ma it is, it's basically Afghanistan with leaves you want to talk about ISR good luck doing your ISR your intelligence surveillance reconnaissance trying to find Taiwanese dudes who are underneath that leaf canopy in the in the uh, west part of the country good luck with that that ain't gonna happen right and every Taiwanese dude knows how to use a gun every single one of them and a lot of their women too a lot of their women are in the reserves they want to be there. So, yeah. 
we talked a bit about before, um, I think Stephen mentioned this, how I think for like my entire life, mm -hmm. I know, I've been hearing about China is going to mm -hmm. go to war, China's going to go to war, China's going to go to war. And now you're projecting it in the next year or the next like two to three to four years. Mm -hmm. So the question is, what's changed that China's ramped up its like military presence? Is it just training more? Is it investing more? Has there been something that's like majorly shifted? Training capability, TikTok's a factor. TikTok. TikTok is a weapon system. Okay. It is a weapon system that is deployed by the People's Republic of China. It is a weapon system no different than a cruise missile. It is a weapon system that can that can militarize people in the U.S. to go against the U.S. interests. It is an incredible weapon system. So you think TikTok is one of the things that's like the nascent or like the driver towards like a Taiwanese war? Uh, not a driver, but it's certainly a psychological operation. I mean, Google the, or look at the Uyghurs, uh, Uyghur Muslims. Uyghur, <coughs> I'm sorry. Uyghur. Uyghur. Uyghur, sorry. I'm from Jersey. I can't even speak English. You're good. All right. Look at the, try to find Uyghur Muslims or the Tiananmen Square massacre on TikTok. What do you think is going to come up? Is there really nothing about that on TikTok? Is that true? Find out for yourself. I don't you have saw that on my phone. Do not. Yeah, <laughs> that's exactly it. When I did, I did a recent video on TikTok. Nick, look it up. Can you find when it? I, when I when I when I when um, I access TikTok, even a business account, I did it inside a virtual machine behind a VPN. That's mm -hmm. how deathly afraid I am of this. I'm, I'm a software cyber guy. Uh, Matt Taibbi, you know the the journalist, mm -hmm. Matt Taibbi actually made fun of me. He said well, he doesn't know what he's talking about. You know, like, you know, I need to go get a journalism degree, too. <laughs> let's go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, let's let's go, buddy. Um, you know, I, I kind of do know what I'm talking about when it comes to cybersecurity. And when you have something like TikTok, I guarantee you, a day after a Chinese invasion, you're going to see a couple of things. One of the first things you're going to see before the invasion is you're going to see China pushing, trying to, uh, to change the public attitude about giving blood. Because right now in China, people don't give blood. It's actually a pretty big problem. Is culturally, you don't give blood in China, right? It's like blood, like special or something. Like or? no, like no. It's just like culturally, like you don't say the number four because it means death. Okay, like thirteen, okay. and you know, there's no thirteenth floor. It's just culturally in China, you don't give blood. So when when China starts putting out propaganda saying like it is for the good of the nation to give blood, that's when we know okay, it's coming. They're trying to change this attitude civilians giving blood mm -hmm. because it's going to be a lot of wounded heading on Taiwan. Taiwan is like a porcupine. Good luck. There's going to be a lot of wounded soldiers and they're all going to need blood. And where's that blood going to come from? It's going to come from the Chinese people, right? Maybe the army. But, you know, that, that's going to be that's going to be the, one of the first signs. Would we blood. even see it, though? Because my understanding is that there's like TikTok, and then there's kind of the American version of, especially mm -hmm. after like Project Texas, that there's like a pretty big siphoning in that. Like, I'm I'm pretty sure like there's a whole TikTok section de dedicated to this is what people on Chinese TikTok get to see. Um, so would we even like see anything like well, this? We have we have people inside of China that'll that'll let us know. Right, but do you yeah. think that like TikTok, because you said it's like the ma most major cyber weapon, do you yeah. think that TikTok after like Project Texas is siloed off enough in the United States to actually be because obviously, um, what is it, Mr. Chu, Xiao Chu is like the, the head of TikTok in mm -hmm. America. When he was grilled by the Senate like just recently again, he was very clear that he's saying like no doubt has ever been given to China um, from TikTok. You just don't believe him. He can him. say, no, I don't believe him one bit. The problem also, I've only watched one of those hearings. Um, you, are you, you're pretty familiar with like cryptocurrency, right? I built a whole cryptocurrency. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. You did say that. Yeah. Have you ever heard somebody try to call somebody out for a crypto scam who doesn't really know that much about cryptocurrency? Um, I I don't know if I've heard seen that. that but it's the conversations are very um, they're very telling to where the person who's done the scam can yeah. always evade responsibility because the guy calling them out doesn't really understand what they're asking. Yeah. And I saw at least one with the TikTok owner, the Ameri American owner, I don't, the, mm -hmm. the, this guy that you were mentioning, um, being questioned by Congress, and the the questions were. It was too vague. It was like, uh, could, could TikTok interact with your TV? And it's like, well, if your phone has Bluetooth or something, of course yeah, it. Yeah, like it doesn't. We're, yeah, we're the, talking about old white men. Exactly. Who yeah. are like, I'm sure their assistants answer their email. Yeah, the technological right? sophistication isn't there to ask the really important no, questions. I, I, mm -hmm. I, I, you could probably look this up. I don't know how many, uh, how many members of Congress are software engineers, but I'll say it's close to zero. <laughs> I mean, there's only one electrician 
in 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 the house. I think it's Bob Menendez. Right. You know, like he's the only electrician. He's probably going to be out soon because of corruption, right? Imagine that, a corrupt union electrician. Yeah. Who would have thought? A corrupt union electrician from New Jersey. Yeah. I would be shocked. But a lot of these <laughs> hearings are like, in many ways, they're like more for like public sport than like. Deep. Yeah, you're not really getting to the bottom of things. The the, the thing that, that scares me about TikTok, I, I did a, a video about um, the APE, it was the APAC, APAC. Mm-hmm. It was the American Palestine Arab Coalition or something. And they were talking about how we're going to block the MV Mara, Mamara, MV, MV Orlando, MV Cape Orlando, I'm sorry. They were going to um, block the MV Cape Orlando from leaving port in Oakland to go um, because it had weapons on it that they were going to deliver to Israel. And so people like glued themselves to the ladder of the MV Cape Orlando. Like, you know, sometimes, um, sometimes these problems have a way of working them their way out, right? But... You know, I actually did a whole video about the MV Cape Orlando, and I don't know if you know about much about the Panama Canal, but right now it is a, a biblical drought in Panama. Mm. And the, the gates, the locks to the Panama Canal are really low. And so they're having trouble. Like, I think the shipping traffic is down by one-third, right? So, like, Because of, like, system malfunctions or? No, it's just, it's just they need water. They need rain. Oh, they need rain. There's a dry. drought in Panama. They need rain to refill the lakes that feed the locks yeah. in the Panama Canal. And so, like, MV Cape Orlando is in Oakland. Like, if you're going to Israel, wouldn't it make sense? To, if you're going to Israel with weapons, wouldn't it make sense to leave from the East Coast? Just putting it out there. It's like these people in APAC never freaking looked at a map. And I made this whole video about these guys are idiots. But they were somehow convinced to go glue themselves the freaking pilot ladder of the MV Cape Orlando to prevent it from leaving. Now, all you need is I, I guarantee you that the day China invades Taiwan, the very next day on TikTok, you're not gonna see anything pro-Taiwan and you're gonna see, you know, uh, Unity Taiwan, uh, I'm, I'm trying to come up with a river to the sea analogy, I'm not, I'm not a poet. Right. I understand what you're saying. I, you think, know, I think it would be more sophisticated than that, though, I, at least looking at how Russians do it. I don't think you would see pro-unity Taiwan, and I don't think you would see anything like that. I think you would see things saying, like, does America need to involve itself in another war? Or why don't we take care of our people at home more than we do the Taiwanese? Or why do we care more about these people than our poor and homeless? I think these are the types of divisive messages that are I mean, that play really well. I guarantee you the chip in that freaking iPad, the chip in that iPad that you've been tapping on, that was made in Taiwan. Probably. That's why we care about it. Because yeah. we can't run our country without Taiwan. Yeah. Taiwan and the U.S. And plus, they're a democracy. At least now they are. They weren't at first, but yeah. now they are. And we kind of have, you know, look, are we the leader of the free world or not? You know, that's it's kind of one of the things. we got to step up to the plate. Are we the leader of the free world? We can talk about America first. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. Yeah, America first. Let's bring back American manufacturing, like Bunker Branding is trying to do, right? Bunker Branding, making T-shirts in America. Fantastic. I love that idea. But you know what? We're going to be the leader of the free world. That might mean we got to step up and make some hard decisions and say, you know what? This is a democracy right here. Don't touch it. And if you touch it, well, we're going to come get you. Kill me. <laughs> we got you uh, some return gifts. I don't know anything about cigars, but apparently. Oh, my God. Thank you so much. Apparently, you like this brand of these cigars. Are, these are Macanoo. Okay. you got to ask me. you got to answer my question before I give these to you. Okay. 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 Why, why are they different sizes? I have, no I, I have no idea. One might be a pyramid. One might be a uh, you don't know. Toro. Didn't you get him those gifts? Uh, uh, I don't know why yeah. they're different sizes. Thank you so much. What I'm going to give you, these are the white series too, which are actually really good. So you see that? This, this is a Toro size white series. Thank you. Absolutely. I, I was going to get you the blue or pink series, but I know so, how cheap those are. So, so I, I'm going to give you a, a Ryan McBeth challenge coin, which has my butt on it, accurate to the hair. Nice. Okay. I don't know. I have no idea. A coin? A coin. Okay. So in the... With, the, um, with actually your butt on it, it? It is actually my butt. Can you want me to go get it right now? You really want to. Okay. You can make it over there without falling over. Yeah. I'm going to go grab... Uh... All right. So Freya. funny story about this. So Kyle, I'm going to give one to you. Okay. And uh, Freya thinks they're treats. I'm give one to you. Now, in the military, you give a coin to someone in their hand. So you shake their hand. Shake their hand like that. Okay. All right. And you say, thank you. Thank you. And then I'm going to give you a coin. Shake your hand. I'm going to say thank you. Okay. So this coin, I don't know whether you can uh, close up on this. Close up on this. 
So this coin has my head right here, and then it has my butt accurate to the hair right here. And uh, this is uh, something I did back when, um, when uh, my channel first took off. I made this video about why Russian soldiers are butt pillows. Now at the time I made this video, <laughs> yes, that's my ass right there. The uh, now that it was it was created that was drawn by a woman I think on Twitter her name is Shellipede, uh, her name is Chelsea she's an artist and she draws like lesbian body transformation pictures. Uh, the very particular precise okay. She okay. Uh, you know let me tell you something I think she's a fantastic artist. Yeah. And like you love while, the lesbian transformation. Well the subject is is a little esoteric I think she's a great artist and she drew me my head and my ass. This is her lesbian art. I, I, yeah, her, her lesbian shellipede on Twitter. <laughs> okay. um, but she uh, she did a great job with that coin. And so when I first started this, you know, the you know about a year after I started my YouTube channel, I made a video about Bitcoin. I built my own crypto system to show people like, hey, if you invest in, in a crypto system, that's cool. But be aware, like people like me could have developed it in two weeks. And here's how it actually works. Here's how you do proof of work. Here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. So you create me an NFT. I built all that and I put it up on GitHub. Uh -huh. So you know, I have I have almost two hundred and sixty thousand followers on YouTube. I think I have five hundred followers on GitHub. Guess what? I'm more proud of, right? <laughs> so like, so I I uh, what's funny is that. So how much this, is the butt coin worth? So the butt. How much? So is it connected to the Bitcoin at all? No. Uh -huh. So in the army. When you do something really good, yeah. but not so good that you you get like a medal, you might get a coin. Funny story. So that I was in the best unit of the Russian army, which is a unit that's actually an American unit. So first to fourth infantry in uh, Honesfels, Germany. All right, I was with those guys, and essentially you're the bad guys. You're the bad guys who so NATO can practice attacking. And I remember this one time. It's it's early in the morning. I'm freaking cold. It's Germany. It's October. I'm like, oh man, this sucks. And I had a Nutrigrain bar. Oh, one of those Nutrigrain bars. They're delicious, especially the blueberry. Right. <laughs> I was saving this Nutrigrain bar. <laughs> saving this Nutrigrain bar. Now, we're the bad guys. We're the Krasnovian army at the time, right? So NATO is going to be attacking us. We don't know when they're attacking. But they're going to attack us. And I open this Nutri-Grain bar. I'm like, oh, I'm gonna have, I'm gonna have the greatest breakfast ever. I can't wait to eat this Nutri-Grain bar. And out in the box for like two weeks, right? NATO attacks. A Bradley fighting vehicle comes up the hill to where our OPLP, our Observation Post Listening Post, is. And I'm the anti-tank guy, so I get out my Dragon anti-tank missile, which is really a Russian Sager, but it's a, you know, an American Dragon pretending to be a Russian Sager. I get out this missile, and the Bradley's coming right toward me. Hit that primary safety. Hit that trigger. That West cartridge goes off. And you know, we're playing laser tag, basically. right? We have lasers on our simulated weapons. It hits the Bradley. And the light goes off. So not, the okay, none of this out. is real. No, this you're not. This is a no. training. This it's is a training training exercise. Training. It's real. It's real. It's, it's a training real, exercise. Train we're like... shooting lasers at each other like laser tag. <laughs> Bradley comes up. I shoot the Bradley. I get a mobility kill. A little light starts going off in the Bradley to let me know the Bradley has a mobility kill. Drop that dragon. And I pick up my rifle. And the ramp. Mobility kill means the crew is dead, but the, the men inside the Bradley can still fight. The ramp comes down on the Bradley. And the guys start coming. I take my rifle and I start shooting. It's like Saving Private Ryan. His guys are coming out of the ramp of this armored fighting vehicle. I'm picking them off. Final guy to come out of the armored fighting vehicle was the oldest E6 staff sergeant I have ever seen in my life. The guy looked like he was 70. He comes out of this Bradley fighting vehicle. And there is, he has a plugger. And back in 1994-ish, plugger was this, it was a GPS system. It was roughly the size of this bottle of, of bourbon, right? So there's this plugger, and it's attached to his thigh, and it's like banging on his thigh. And I finally shoot him. My laser hits his sensor, and his sensor goes off. 
Bang, and he was dead. And when you, when you hear that sound, you're supposed to take a key out of the transmitter, laser transmitter in your weapon, you put the key in your harness, it turns off the sound, and you're dead. You take off your helmet, put your helmet on the ground, and you're a casualty. This guy, I shot him. He takes off his helmet, throws it on the ground, he goes, thank God! <laughs> I don't know what his day was like, but it couldn't have been good. And uh, later on, I got a medal for killing my first tank, and that was the only armored vehicle I ever destroyed. <laughs> 20 years as an anti-armor guy, never fired around in anger. But I got a coin for it. And that, so today, when you give a coin to someone, it's a way of saying thank you. And you know, one of the ways I would love to end this, I know this is your show, but I wanted to come on here because I think that God gave you a gift. That you are this important figure today that is teaching younger people how to think critically. And you have the best fans I've ever seen on the internet. And I am honored to have been invited on your show. Why? Thanks for coming. I'm honored that you came. You've got a fascinating background. You've got a lot of information. And I can only do what I do because people like you decide to talk to me. So thank you so much. And thank you so much. Where can they find you online? Uh, well, you can find me at uh, on YouTube, Ryan Macbeth Program, or go to ryanmcbeth.substack.com to see all the stuff that I can't show you on YouTube. And hopefully this show won't be demonetized either because right now I'm in YouTube jail. Awesome. Well, you know, I, uh, I thank God for you too, Stephen. Um, any wrap-up notes? Any things that people need to know in your community? Nope. Think we're good. Any logistics? Well, I'll talk about it on stream. Thanks a lot for coming. And, yeah, I'm sure I'll talk to you in the future. Check out Bunker Branding. There's lots of cool stuff. If you want some cool swag and merch, I think it's all clothing, right? Mm-hmm. Yep. Uh, thank you so much. And uh, check in for episode three. It should be on April 5th. We've got the Krasenstein twins coming on. So look forward to that.